There's two ways to enjoy this video. You can watch it because there's great graphics, or you can listen while you drive or work. Regardless, you're going to come out with a top-notch level of knowledge about Lutherans. This is a compilation of most of my information-dense videos on Lutherans so far. I've cut out any outros, so there's no wasted minutes. It's just solid education. We'll begin with a look at the major conservative Lutheran denomination in the United States, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is a primarily American Lutheran denomination. Unlike Roman Catholicism, Lutheran denominations are completely independent from each other, so the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, or LCMS, is not just a synod within a higher denominational structure. It's a self-governing Lutheran denomination. The LCMS is the largest Lutheran denomination in the United States that enforces adherence to its confessions, what is called confessional Lutheran. These confessions are all of those listed in the Book of Concord. There is one larger Lutheran denomination in the United States, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or ELCA, but it is much more theologically liberal and doesn't require ministers to adhere to Lutheran theology any longer. The LCMS is Trinitarian. In their doctrinal explanation titled, Brief Statement of the Doctrinal Position of the Missouri Synod, they state, on the basis of the Holy Scriptures, we teach the sublime article of the Holy Trinity. That is, we teach that the one true God is the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, three distinct persons, but of one and the same divine essence, equal in power, equal in eternity, equal in majesty, because each person possesses the one divine essence entire. We hold that all teachers and communions that deny the doctrine of the Holy Trinity are outside the pale of the Christian Church. As with other confessional Christian denominations, the LCMS believes in the deity of Christ, his virgin birth, his literal bodily resurrection, and a literal future judgment in heaven and hell. With other confessional Lutherans, the LCMS affirms a view of sacraments as opposed to ordinances. There are at least two sacraments, Holy Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some would say that absolution is a third sacrament. The Apology of the Augsburg Confession states, Therefore, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and absolution, which is the sacrament of repentance, are truly sacraments. In 2018, the LCMS Commission on Theology and Church Relations produced a report on confession and absolution. Here are some of what they said. Although confessional Lutheranism never repudiated its affirmation of individual confession, the practice is not regularly maintained by most Lutheran Christians, including pastors. Perhaps the most common source of Lutheran discomfort with private confession is the widespread notion that, despite some differences between Lutheran and Roman teaching, the practice is too Catholic. In this respect, many Lutherans seem to share a Protestant or Evangelical bias against private confession. For Lutherans, then, those who exercise the office of the keys in confession are entrusted with a twofold power and responsibility, to retain the sins of the impenitent and to forgive the sins of the penitent. The ultimate goal, however, is always to absolve the penitent. Private confession and absolution is an actual means of grace. It is one of the ways that sins are forgiven. Forgiveness is not merely an announcement or a proclamation, but it truly gives and affects what is proclaimed. For example, God said, let there be light, Genesis 1-3, and light appeared. In the same way, God says, I forgive you, in the absolution, and the forgiveness that Christ won for us is actually conveyed. So in the LCMS, although private confession may not be practiced often or at all in some congregations, it is viewed as legitimate and a means of grace. Also in the report on confession, the LCMS clarifies their teaching on how sacraments play a role in salvation. Certainly, Lutheran theology teaches that forgiveness of sins is given only on account of Christ's atoning death and resurrection. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Moreover, it is God alone who forgives our sins. Repentant faith believes that sins are forgiven on account of Christ, consoles the conscience, and liberates it from terrors. So Lutherans condemn the notion that sacraments, including confession, justify ex opere operato, that is, by the mere performance of the act. Rather, they are rightly used when received in faith for the strengthening of faith. It is by the voice of the gospel that we obtain the forgiveness of sins by faith, and to deny it is to show contempt for the blood and death of Christ. Baptism is taught as a means of grace in providing salvation. The LCMS says, Baptism, too, is applied for the remission of sins and is therefore a washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Baptism is primarily for infants, but those coming into the church unbaptized may be baptized as adults. The LCMS FAQ on baptism states, Lutherans do not believe that only those baptized as infants receive faith. Faith can also be created in a person's heart by the power of the Holy Spirit working through God's written or spoken word. Baptism should then soon follow conversion for the purpose of confirming and strengthening faith in accordance with God's command and promise. Depending on the situation, therefore, Lutherans baptize people of all ages from infancy to adulthood. 
Infant baptism is taught as producing faith in the child. The LCMS states, We believe that when an infant is baptized, God creates faith in the heart of that infant. We believe this because the Bible says that infants can believe, Matthew 18, 6, and that new birth regeneration happens in baptism. The mode is usually sprinkling, though other modes are acceptable. The LCMS states, Lutherans have therefore held that the manner of baptism, that is, immersion, pouring, sprinkling, etc., does not determine whether a baptism is valid, any more than the manner of distributing the Lord's Supper, common cup, individual glasses, affects the validity of this sacrament. Only the word of God and the element, water, according to divine institution, makes a baptism valid. The LCMS blog reports the following on the practice of confirmation. Today in the LCMS, some 99% of the congregations offer the rite of confirmation. The LCMS affirms the real presence of Christ in the elements of the Lord's Supper. In their book, The Theology and Practice of the Lord's Supper, they say, The clear claim of Christ in Holy Scripture is that his true body and blood are truly present and distributed to those who eat. The LCMS rejects the view of the Lord's Supper as symbolic as well as transubstantiation. The same book states, any effort to make the this is something less than a clear word as Reformed theology does by denying the real presence of the body and blood of Christ on earth is a departure from Christ's words. On the other hand, it is also fruitless to engage in theories about how the body and blood are present in, with, and under the bread and wine. A dogma such as transubstantiation as generally taught by Roman Catholicism is not set forth by scripture. The sacrament is also viewed as bringing divine grace. Jesus now presents his body and blood in bread and wine as the means of divine grace for the forgiveness of sins. On the Bible, the LCMS holds to a 66-book biblical canon. On the apocryphal books, Martin Luther said that they are not held equal to the scriptures, but are useful and good to read. German Bibles of Luther's translation contain the apocrypha for centuries. In 2012, the LCMS publisher Concordia Publishing House published a Lutheran edition of the apocrypha in English. The Bible is viewed as the word of God, inspired, inerrant, and infallible. The LCMS states, We teach that the Holy Scriptures differ from all other books in the world in that they are the word of God. They are the word of God because the holy men of God who wrote the scriptures wrote only that which the Holy Ghost communicated to them by inspiration. We teach also that the verbal inspiration of the scriptures is not a so-called theological deduction, but that it is taught by direct statements of the scriptures. Since the holy scriptures are the word of God, it goes without saying that they contain no errors or contradictions, but that they are in all their parts and words the infallible truth, also in those parts which treat of historical, geographical, and other secular matters. Officially, the LCMS holds to a literal six-day creation viewpoint. In their FAQ on the Age of the Earth, they state, The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod does not have an official position on the precise age of the earth, since the Bible itself does not tell us how old the earth is, nor is it the synod's position that everything in the Bible is to be understood literally. There is much in the Bible that clearly purports not to be understood literally, but this must be determined by the Bible itself, not by science or human reason. There is nothing in the Bible itself to suggest that the creation account is not meant to be taken literally. The Synod has affirmed the belief, therefore, based on Scripture's account of creation in the book of Genesis and other clear passages of Scripture, that God, by the almighty power of his word, created all things in six days by a series of creative acts, that Adam and Eve were real historical human beings, the first two people in the world, and that we must confess what Paul says in Romans 5.12 about the origin of sin through Adam as described in Genesis 3, 1967, Synodical Resolution 231. The Synod has also, therefore, stated that it rejects all those worldviews, philosophical theories, exegetical interpretations, and other hypotheses which pervert these biblical teachings and thus obscure the gospel, 1967 Synodical Resolution 231. At the same time, the Synod firmly believes that there can be no actual contradiction between genuine scientific truth and the Bible. When it comes to the issue of the age of the earth, several possibilities exist for harmonizing biblical teachings with scientific studies. Despite this official teaching, in 2014, the Pew Research Center's Religious Landscape Survey showed that only 45% of the LCMS members surveyed affirm that humankind always existed in their present form, and 52% affirming some kind of human evolution. Perhaps due to this divide between the laity and the denomination's official views, in the 2019 LCMS convention, the LCMS passed a resolution to reinforce their belief in six-day creation. The resolution states in part, 
Whereas many pastors and other church workers may not be familiar with synod statements regarding the scriptural teaching on creation and our place within that creation, therefore be it resolved that the synod in convention confess that Holy Scripture teaches that God created the world in six natural days. We confess the duration of these natural days is proclaimed in God's word. There was evening and there was morning the first day. Genesis 1.5 the creation of the first man, Adam, who was made in the image of God, Genesis 1.27, was a historical event. Death came into the world as the consequence of Adam's sin, Romans 5.12, and be it further resolved that pastors and other church workers be encouraged to confess, witness to, and uphold in their teaching the synod's publicly stated positions as set forth in the brief statement of the doctrinal position of the Missouri Synod, Article 5. On the human sin nature, the LCMS states, we must confess what Paul says in Romans 5.12 about the origin of sin through Adam, as described in Genesis 3. The LCMS rejects the common evangelical teaching of a one-time salvation experience based on a moment of faith, but rather that the ongoing sacraments are part of a person's reception of salvation grace. They say, we reject as a dangerous error the doctrine which disrupted the Church of the Reformation that the grace and the Spirit of God are communicated not through the external means ordained by Him, but by an immediate operation of grace. This erroneous doctrine bases the forgiveness of sins or justification upon a fictitious infused grace, that is, upon a quality of man, and thus establishes the work doctrine of the papists. We discussed earlier how the LCMS views baptism as a sacrament bringing salvation grace. However, the LCMS does not teach that a person cannot be saved without baptism. In their FAQ, they state, The LCMS does not believe that baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation. All true believers in the Old Testament era were saved without baptism. Mark 16.16 16 implies that it is not the absence of baptism that condemns a person, but the absence of faith. And there are clearly other ways of coming to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, reading or hearing the word of God. Still, baptism dare not be despised or willfully neglected since it is explicitly commanded by God and has his precious promises attached to it. On whether good works are part of salvation, the LCMS states, The central and consistent teaching of Paul, that we are justified by grace alone through faith alone on account of Christ, is nowhere more beautifully summarized than in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of works. By its very definition, grace means that human works do not contribute in any way to a person's salvation or justification, as St. Paul says in Romans 11.6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. Or as the Apostle had already said in 3.28, a man is justified by faith apart from Greek chorus works of law. As Luther again put it once, as an apple tree makes fruit, and the fruit does not make an apple tree. So works do not make a Christian, but a Christian does good works. On the details of election and salvation, the LCMS FAQ quotes Dr. Thomas Mantufel positively in explaining its differences from the traditional Reformed or Presbyterian views. Total depravity is affirmed, but the LCMS position is at odds with the other four points of Calvinism. Mantufel states, in opposition to unconditional election, the Bible does not teach, as do the Calvinists, that some are predestined for damnation. God wants all to be saved. In contrast to limited atonement, he says, It is true that Christ died for the church and purchased it with his blood, Ephesians 5.25, Acts 20.28. Furthermore, his atoning death does not mean that all people are saved, 1 Corinthians 1.18. However, Jesus died for all, 2 Corinthians 5.15. In contrast to irresistible grace, he says, Scripture warns we can resist God's gracious call. Some people do resist God's grace or all would be saved. Furthermore, God warns us not to resist his grace. In contrast to perseverance of the saints, he says, We affirm with scripture that those who are predestined to salvation cannot be lost, but will continue by God's power to a blessed end. Scripture does not teach, however, that those who come to faith cannot lose that faith. At the height of the charismatic movement, the LCMS made a booklet addressing charismatism. While not condemning the charismatic movement wholesale, the book made it clear that the charismatic claim of the ongoing gifts of tongues, miracles, and so forth was not their doctrine. The book said, while Lutherans rejoice in the gracious promise that the gift of the Holy Spirit will be given to all generations of believers, Acts 2.39, neither the scriptures nor the Lutheran confessions support the view that this gift of the Spirit necessarily includes such extraordinary spiritual gifts as tongues, miracles, miraculous healings, and prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12. According to the pattern revealed in the Bible, God does not necessarily give his church in all ages the same special gifts. He bestows his blessings according to his good pleasure. The book also stated, it is contrary to the Holy Scriptures and therefore or dangerous to the salvation of men to teach, number one, that God desires every Christian following baptism to have a second experience, such as the baptism with the Spirit, 
that the so-called gifts of the Spirit are external signs by which we can assure ourselves that we have faith, are living in God's grace, or have the Spirit of God. That God promises every Christian such gifts as speaking in tongues, healing, discerning of spirits, and prophecy, and that God has given such a promise as part of the full or complete gospel. On end times, or eschatology, the LCMS is amillennial, or in other words, they do not teach a literal 1,000-year millennium. They therefore do not teach in a rapture of believers separate from the second coming of Christ, or believe in a literal seven-year tribulation. Their FAQ states, Lutherans certainly believe what Paul teaches in this passage, namely, that those who are still living on earth when Christ returns visibly on the last day will be caught up, raptured, together with the dead in Christ to meet the Lord in the air. Some Christians teach, however, that the rapture will take place not on the last day, but in connection with an invisible coming of Christ occurring before a seven-year period of tribulation on earth, allowing Christians to escape this tribulation and then later return to earth for a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. Lutherans do not believe that these teachings are based on a proper understanding of Scripture. Scripture teaches that all Christians will endure varying degrees of tribulation until the last day, that Christ will return only once visibly to catch up, rapture all believers, living and dead unto heaven, and that all believers will reign forever with him in heaven. Lutherans understand the 1,000 years of Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15 to be a figurative reference to Christ's reign here and now in the hearts and lives of believers, which will culminate in our reigning with Christ forever in heaven following his return on the last day. On homosexuality, the 2001 LCMS Convention Resolution Ministry to Homosexuals and Their Families said in part, the law of God declares homosexual lust and activity to be sin and contrary to the created order. And also, the Synod in Convention encourages its congregations to minister to homosexuals and their families in a spirit of compassion and humility, recognizing that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In November 1987, the LCMS produced a study booklet on divorce and remarriage. The following excerpts of their summary statements should clarify LCMS teaching on the matter. When God instituted marriage at creation, he intended that it be the lifelong union of one man and one woman. By its very nature, the one flesh union of husband and wife will not permit the intrusion of a third party. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Divorce, destructive of what God has joined together, is always contrary to God's intention for marriage. A person who divorces his or her spouse for any other cause than sexual unfaithfulness and marries another commits adultery. Anyone who marries a person so discarding his or her spouse commits adultery. When a spouse commits fornication, i.e. is guilty of sexual unfaithfulness, which breaks the unity of the marriage, the offended party who endures such unfaithfulness has the right, though not the command, to obtain a legal divorce and remarry. A spouse who has been willfully and definitively abandoned by his or her partner who refuses to be reconciled and is unwilling to fulfill the obligations of the marriage covenant despite persistent persuasion may seek a legal divorce, which in such a case constitutes a public recognition of a marriage already broken and remarry. The request of divorced persons desiring remarriage must be evaluated and a response given that is in harmony with what the scriptures teach regarding repentance and the forgiveness of sins. In cases of the remarriage of persons divorced for reasons not biblically sanctioned, true repentance would presuppose a genuine desire to reconcile with one's estranged spouse. It is difficult to imagine, for example, how genuine contrition can exist or how absolution can be announced when there is present a refusal to seek healing. Where the refusal to reconcile and to seek healing is judged to be absent, insofar as such a judgment is possible, the pastor will be constrained to deny a request for remarriage. On abortion and taking of life, the 1984 LCMS document Abortion in Perspective says, It has become increasingly common in our society to speak as if taking life, whether of the unborn through abortion, of the handicapped or retarded child through benign neglect or infanticide, or of the suffering and the senile through euthanasia, were a way of serving the well-being of those whose lives we take. Against all such misuse of language, Christians insist that the task entrusted us by God is to help and befriend our neighbor in every bodily need, not to rush the neighbor out of existence and beyond the realm of bodily need. In this book, after making a scriptural case, it is stated, The scriptural principles offered here compel us to regard abortion on demand, not only as a sin against the fifth commandment, forbidding the destruction of human life, but also as a grievous offense against the first, that we worship the one true God and cling to him alone. Traditional worship with the hymns and liturgical style is more common than contemporary among LCMS churches. There are those within the LCMS who are opposed to contemporary worship styles, but many churches do offer contemporary services. 
In 1996, the LCMS Commission on Worship produced a document called Reflections on Contemporary Alternative Worship, in which they stated, In recent years, a significant debate has emerged in our synod concerning our way of worship. Partly out of a desire to communicate the gospel more effectively both to members and to the unchurched, a number of congregations have altered the orders of service provided in our hymnals. For some, this foray into what is commonly called contemporary worship entails substituting new materials for various parts of the liturgy. For others, the services go well beyond altering existing worship patterns. Rather, they have chosen to design services that clearly depart from the historic pattern of worship that has been handed down to succeeding generations of Christians for nearly 2,000 years. The controversy over worship styles continues today. Along with Luther himself, the LCMS is not opposed to consuming alcohol. Their FAQ states, The Bible nowhere condemns the proper and responsible use, consumption of alcoholic beverages, and neither does the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Scripture does warn strongly and repeatedly against the abuse, misuse, or excessive use of alcoholic beverages, and the LCMS has also repeatedly warned against such dangers. The LCMS does not teach a required tithe, that is, the giving of 10% of one's income to the church. Their FAQ states, While tithing may be a good spiritual discipline and a good starting point for a mature Christian, it may not be the best way to present biblical giving, since it can easily become a legalistic requirement of the law rather than a cheerful offering motivated by the love of God shown toward us in Christ. LCMS churches typically have a form of congregational polity led by a pastor. The biblical term of bishop is synonymous with the office of pastor. LCMS churches typically have lay offices of elder or deacon. The LCMS FAQ states, Strictly speaking, the word elder in the Bible refers to those who hold the pastoral office. What we commonly call elders in the LCMS are laypersons appointed to serve a congregation in various ways, in keeping with its constitution and bylaws. Such elders hold an office that is humanly defined and is not the equal of biblical elders. As a humanly defined office, the term elder itself does not have a uniform meaning throughout the synod. Indeed, some congregations prefer the term deacon to refer to laymen with similar duties. Elders or deacons typically support and assist the pastor in his spiritual and administrative tasks toward the goal of nurturing and strengthening the spiritual life, mission, and ministry of the congregation. The office of pastor is divinely instituted and indispensable for the church, but an elder or deacon is a humanly instituted office. Where it exists, it seeks to provide help, support, and encouragement for pastors. Churches may also have deaconesses. The LCMS website says, LCMS deaconesses are women who are professional church workers, trained to share the gospel of Jesus Christ through works of mercy, spiritual care, and teaching the Christian faith. Deaconess, from the Greek word diakonos, means servant. The LCMS does not ordain women to the office of pastor. A 1994 report of the Commission of Theology and Church Relations titled The Service of Women in Congregational and Synodical Offices stated, In addition to the moral and vocational qualifications required of those divinely placed into this high office in the church, 1 Timothy 3, 1-7, Titus 3, verses 5-9, through the scriptures teach that the incumbent of the pastoral office must be a man. LCMS ministers are not required to be celibate. The LCMS is in full altar and pulpit fellowship with 38 other Lutheran denominations from around the world, including four with which fellowship was established in 2019. A small but notable U.S. denomination they are in fellowship with is the American Association of Lutheran Churches. The LCMS is a member of the International Lutheran Council, but not part of the Lutheran World Federation, National Council of Churches, World Council of Churches, or National Association of Evangelicals. Membership in the LCMS in 1925 was 628,000, which increased to 1.6 million in 1950. 1970 was the peak of membership, just under 2.8 million. In 2015, their membership was just under 2.1 million, and the 2018 report sets membership at 1,968,641 and 6,046 congregations. Now, let's turn to the largest Lutheran denomination in the United States and learn about the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or ELCA, is, as of 2020, the largest American Lutheran denomination. It was established in 1988 by the merging of three other Lutheran denominations, the American Lutheran Church, Lutheran Church in America, and the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches. At the time, there were over 5 million members. The membership in the ELCA is significantly older than the U.S. population as a whole. For example, there are more ELCA members aged 70 through 74 
than members aged 45 through 59 in the ELCA, though 45 through 59 year olds are more than double 70 through 74 year olds in the US population. We'll look at several more statistics near to the end of this video. As Lutheran denominations, historically, the doctrine of the churches and denominations that have now come together into today's ELCA follow the Lutheran confessions. The ELCA's website says the following. The ELCA's official confession of faith identifies the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, commonly called the Bible, the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creeds, and the Lutheran confessional writings in the Book of Concord as the basis for our teaching. ELCA congregations make the same affirmation in their governing documents, and ELCA pastors and deacons promise to carry out their ministry in accordance with these teaching sources. So officially, the ELCA is still connected to these Lutheran documents. However, the ELCA doesn't enforce adherence to the confessions, and many ministers would take stances on issues that are in disagreement with the confessions. The ELCA's theological discernment team produces the Journal of Lutheran Ethics. Catherine Kleinens wrote in the 2011 article in the journal, Sources of Authority in the Lutheran Tradition, Back to the Future, the following. The image I have frequently used with students to convey this systemic understanding of Lutheran theology is the image of software. Inputting different data into a computer program yields different results, and yet these results are no less authentically an expression of the program than the earlier results. What Lutherans need to say today will not always be the same as what Luther and his fellow confessors said in the 16th century, nor should it be, but that need not make it any less authentically and confessionally Lutheran. Kleinens also says, It is precisely in the process of interpreting and applying our Lutheran confessional heritage in new contexts that reason and experience play a role, not as external sources sitting in judgment over the scriptures and the confessions, but as important resources for us as we wrestle with the scriptures and the confessions in order to bring forth new blessings in our day. At the end of the journal article, she summarizes it this way. In the mutual conversation and consolation of fellow Christians, we need to confess not only our theology, but our unfurtikite, our unfinishedness, and we need to come together, particularly in common confession, both of sin and of faith, in worship. And in lifting up this vision of common Lutheran confession, I must also confess the painful knowledge that this very vision of a committed but unfinished Lutheranism means that some of our fellow Lutherans will not join us at the table. Examples of those Lutherans that won't join the ELCA at the table are the theologically conservative Lutheran denominations in the United States, such as the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. The ELCA's acceptance of reading the confessions in a living way and taking a historical critical view of the scriptures has led to these denominations distancing themselves from the ELCA. However, at the same time the ELCA has been moving toward allowing the modern conceptions of scripture and life to have an influence on their theology, other traditional mainline denominations in the United States have done the same. And so the ELCA has opened full communion with these groups that prior to their willingness to overlook denominational distinctives would have shunned joining with Lutheranism. For example, the ELCA is in full communion with the Presbyterian Church USA, Reformed Church in America, United Church of Christ, the Moravian Church, and the United Methodist Church. This means that these churches work together, members between them share in communion, and ministers can freely move between congregations of each denomination, among other agreements. Because of this, to try and explain the theology of the ELCA by referencing the literal meaning of the confessions they hold to would be anachronistic. There are parts of the Book of Concord that most in the ELCA would disagree with the literal meaning. So instead, we need to look at the published positions of the church and things written by its ministers. Even so, realize that in the denomination today, you would be hard-pressed to find a theological position that would get a minister kicked out, so some of the generalities that we'll be giving as the positions of the ELCA will not hold true for every ELCA congregation. As we discuss the doctrinal positions of the ELCA, let me quote a few more articles from ELCA Voices to give examples of the acceptable range of thought on the historicity of the Bible. Rachel Wangenhook writes in Incarnation and the Holy Innocence in the Journal of Lutheran Ethics, it is tempting to get caught up in questions of historicity in this text. Did Herod the Great actually murder all of the boys aged two and under in Bethlehem? Did Jesus, Mary, and Joseph flee to Egypt? Did the Magi actually travel from the east, stop in to see Herod, and then go on to greet Mary and son at the house where they stayed? Wouldn't Josephus at least have noted the first of those remarkable events? However, delving into questions of historicity in the birth narrative, especially this portion of it, quickly leads to missing the point entirely. 
My preaching professor at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, Dr. Tom Rogers, said something I'll never forget. When folks ask if the illustration or story you tell is true, respond honestly. It happens every day. In the case of a massacre of innocents and a flight of a family as political refugees into a foreign land, this is indeed the truth. This is the world God became flesh in and still dwells with us in. Nyveen Saras writes in the Journal of Lutheran Ethics article, A Palestinian Feminist Reading of the Book of Jonah, I argue that the narrative of Jonah itself is the key of interpretation equally important to the character of Jonah himself. It could be interpreted as a symbol, proverb, fiction, or tale. The author uses hyperbolic language, such as describing Nineveh as the great city, or having a fish swallow Jonah, and making Jonah remain in the belly of the fish for three days. The use of hyperbole becomes apparent when one considers questions such as, how could Jonah breathe in the belly of the fish? If the fish was a whale, can we find a whale in rivers like the Tigris or Euphrates? These descriptions invite us to concentrate on the theme behind the book, not the detailed expressions. An article from the ELCA's website in 2009 said, from about A.D. 80 to the present, most Christian faith groups, including Lutherans, have taught that Jesus was conceived by his mother, Mary, while she was still a virgin. While it remains official and normative for the Evangelical Lutheran Church today, it has not closed the doctrinal debate over Jesus' conception for many Lutherans, and by inference, that includes ELCA members. When we confess in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, and in the Nicene Creed that Jesus is the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, we are not making a gynecological assertion. We are saying that God entered into Christ and in him is fully revealed to humankind. This is God's graceful act of reconciliation with creation and humankind's redemption. It's safe to say that very few theologians in the ELCA would hold to an inerrant view of the Bible, and so acceptable views on most issues can be very broad. The Trinity is typically affirmed as opposed to Unitarianism. However, in April 2020, the ELCA Twitter account tweeted, Mother God, you have fed us with the nourishment of your spiritual food. Raise us up into salvation and rid us of our bitterness so that we may share the sweetness of your holy word with all the world. An example of how positions that many other Trinitarian churches would consider unorthodox are not unacceptable in the ELCA. Christ's deity is also commonly affirmed, and most mentions of the virgin birth to people on the pews would be in the affirmative, but non-literal understanding of the virgin birth is acceptable. Even the resurrection of Christ is a literal event, although frequently affirmed throughout ELCA material can be taught as less than literal. Pastor David Nichols of Mount Tabor Lutheran Church writes, Ancient stories of why is this so and how did this come to be that taught wisdom applicable to the common good and to humankind's role in living for the common good were replaced with empirical evidence-based reporting of natural phenomena devoid of subjective ethical imperatives. Humankind fell in love with objective analysis and began exclusively calling that truth. This set up a completely unnecessary dichotomy, I believe, regarding the notion of truth. For example, in modern ELCA interpretation of the Bible, we use the both-and approach. We empirically analyze the context of the ancient story for what that can tell us about what does not apply today, and we ask, what is the symbolic truth within it? What is the story trying to tell us about who God is and what God expects of us? This is called the postmodern approach to biblical study, and it's how I do it. But we postmoderns get bogged down in asking, is this real? Did it really happen? That's the wrong question to ask of a symbol. Postmodern humans say if it isn't real in a factual scientific sense, then it must not be a believable truth. But the question of belief is not whether it's objectively real or not. The question of believable truth is about whether or not it promotes the common good. In essence, whether or not it rings true for us, whether or not it promotes the highest calling of humanity to be steward, protector, and promoter of the well-being of every single species on the earth. The story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is a calling to humanity, to us, to again fulfill our highest purpose as stewards of the common good. It is the story of what God's compassion looks like, the story of divine compassion rooted in the human story, calling the human species to look at how we are living and to aspire to be more. On sacraments, the ELCA says, Lutherans have two sacraments, holy baptism and holy communion, and... For Lutherans, a sacrament is something Jesus commanded us to do, uses a physical element, something we can see, touch, and sometimes taste, and is connected with God's promise, the word of God which gives faith. 
Baptism is usually for infants, but unbaptized adults may be baptized as well. Immersion, pouring, or sprinkling are all valid modes. The ELCA 2013 document, How is Language Used in Worship?, speaks of the baptismal formula, saying, According to the ecumenically received baptismal formula, holy baptism is administered using water and the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America Conference of Bishops, in their 1991 statement on the Trinitarian baptismal formula, upholds this name as the name in which this church baptizes. The ecumenical church is presently engaged in discussions, seeking to expand and enrich language used to address the triune God. Such discussions eventually may produce additional formulations. Until then, the current baptismal formula continues to be the only one recognized in the ELCA. Church liturgy and material on baptism affirms that it is part of salvation. The article on the ELCA website from Melinda Quivic, Better in the Sunshine, the Fragility of Faith and the Gift of Baptism, says, The church should be proclaiming God's welcome. Here is new life for you, free in the waters of baptism. Here is food for the journey, free at the table of the risen one. Luther wrote, Baptism signifies two things, death and resurrection. That is full and complete justification. In short, baptism saves. An ELCA thanksgiving for baptism includes the line, Praise to you for the water of baptism and for your word that saves us in this sacrament. ELCA churches may practice confirmation, also called affirmation of baptism. The liturgy goes this way. You have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? Each person responds, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. A worship resource on the ELCA website on the Elements of Communion says, Congregations in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America express unity, but not uniformity, in their communion practices. While there is diversity in our practices, many congregations use bread and wine. The resource goes on to suggest white wine over red wine and allow the use of non-alcoholic wine, especially in cases of health issues. Bread can be leavened or unleavened, and it may also be in the form of a host or wafer. Another resource guide says that the common cup, individual glasses, and intinction, or dipping the bread in the wine, are all acceptable options. It also states, We believe that Christ is fully present in one kind, referring to the belief that even if just one of the elements is consumed, such as the bread only, that both the body and blood of Christ are present in the one kind. Common practice is to receive the elements standing or kneeling at the altar or at stations. The ELCA resource Declaration on the Way, Church, Ministry, and Eucharist, says of the presence of Christ, Lutherans and Catholics agree that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ himself is present. He is present truly, substantially, as a person, and he is present in his entirety as Son of God and a human being. Catholics conceive of this presence of Christ as being brought about through the transformation of the original substances, or central realities, of the Eucharistic bread and wine into the substance or reality of the divinized body and blood of Christ by what Thomas Aquinas and the Council of Trent refer to as transubstantiation. Lutherans traditionally affirm that Christ is truly present in, with, and under the bread and wine, but do not usually speak of a transformation of the elements themselves. The 66 books of the Old and New Testament make up the ELCA's Bible, but the ELCA's Revised Common Lectionary does refer to the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books in some readings. As we have already discussed, the ELCA's view on scripture is not one of inerrancy, and use of the historical critical method is all but a given. The 2014 Pew Research Center's Religious Landscape Survey showed that among members of the ELCA polled, 20% say the Bible is the Word of God and should be taken literally, 42% say it is the Word of God but not everything should be taken literally, and 29% said it is not the Word of God. The same survey also showed that among members of the ELCA polled, 66% affirmed human evolution and 30% said humans always existed in their present form. An article on the ELCA website says, The ELCA has not officially taken a position about evolution. The ELCA teaches that the scriptures witness that all of life is a gift of God. However, the scriptures do not say, for example, how God's creating word, let there be, brings creatures into being. An article hosted on the ELCA website by David Rhodes says, 
Also, from a modern scientific point of view, we are kin to other creatures of mind and body, DNA and the environment. Humans are mammals, higher primates, and more. We have evolved with all plants and animals. We are embedded in Earth and its systems. This is what we know of God's incredible creation in our time, and it is consistent with what the Bible has told us about the understanding that the ancients had about the relationship of humans to Earth. Over 2,400 ELCA leaders signed the clergy letter from American Christian clergy, an open letter concerning religion and science, a pro-evolution statement that says in part, the overwhelming majority of Christians do not read the Bible literally as they would a science textbook. Many of the beloved stories found in the Bible, the creation, Adam and Eve, Noah and the ark, convey timeless truths about God, human beings, and the proper relationship between creator and creation expressed in the only form capable of transmitting these truths from generation to generation. Religious truth is of a different order from scientific truth. ELCA articles and documents affirm a belief in original sin. What about the ELCA's beliefs on salvation? There is a diversity of beliefs. Michael Stolzfus in the Journal of Lutheran Ethics writes, On the matter of salvation, everything depends on God. To ask why some people are saved and others damned is to display the pride so characteristic of humanity's sinful condition, the unwillingness to let God be God. Jen Krause, writing for the ELCA Faith Lens blog on the story of Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3 says, In these verses, Jesus explains to Nicodemus that everyone who wants to see God's kingdom has to be born again. The word again can also be translated from above. This is a spiritual birth, the beginning of a relationship with God through Christ that is meant to develop throughout our lives. It's not some kind of one-time decision for Christ, after which we can elevate ourselves above all the non-believers. Like every label, it's been twisted, sometimes by the media and sometimes by those who call themselves born again. The ELCA's Living Lutheran website article, By the Light of Grace, written by Timothy Wengert, is very informative on the views of some in the ELCA on salvation, heaven, and hell. Wengert embeds several key quotes in the article, which emphasize life now over the question of the afterlife. Since God is not a place, and the absence of God is also not a place, we can help people focus on their relationship with the triune God and their lives now, rather than focus on fears and the question, where will I go when I die? Roger Willer, ELCA Director for Theological Ethics and ELCA Churchwide Liaison for Faith and Science. I don't hear people being concerned about getting to heaven or going to hell someday. I hear people concerned about how their faith is making a difference in their daily lives and the lives of their neighbors. Tracy Bartholomew, Bishop of the New Jersey Synod. The biblical writers seem far less interested in what might happen to us after death and far more interested confessing God's presence in our lives right now, in abiding presence that will accompany us throughout all of this life and into the one to come. David Lowe's, a pastor of Mount Olivet Lutheran Church, Minneapolis. Wengert himself closes out the article as follows. We might better say about heaven and hell that yes, they exist, but that whether they are full or empty is up to God, not us which is why we both confess in the creed that Jesus, not human beings, will come to judge the living and the dead, and sing with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, goodness is stronger than evil, ELW 721. Meanwhile, leaving the judging where it belongs in God's hands, we wait. And yet, at the same time, these remarkable pictures of life after death in the Bible provide exactly the comfort for us that Jesus intended. Today, you will be with me in paradise. On the basis of that promise, we too can desire to depart and be with Christ while at the same time praying with the early church, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. What about the views in the ELCA as it relates to the doctrines of grace or the five points of Calvinism? It's safe to say that you aren't going to find many ELCA churches where anyone will bring up things like total depravity, unconditional election, etc., whether to affirm or condemn them. Historically, Lutherans accept total depravity and reject the other four points of TULIP. We discuss that in more detail on the video on the confessional Lutheran Church Missouri Synod here on the Ready to Harvest channel. The ELCA does not teach entire sanctification. The charismatic movement did touch the ELCA. Many ELCA members participated in the conferences and work done through the International Lutheran Renewal Center, an organization that promoted charismatic theology and experience in Lutheranism. In 2014, the organization closed down, though the Canadian branch continues. Their website states, the charismatic renewal was a gift from God to the church. All of us benefited from it in one way or another. Its time has passed. Much of what was controversial in the movement is now accepted as the norm. But in some ways, the crisis has worsened. Apostasy is rampant. 
the need for a personal relationship with Jesus has never been greater. There are those in the ELCA who hold to charismatic theology in one form or another, but most would be either opposed to it or not consider it relevant. There is very little to be found in ELCA literature on the topic of end times or eschatology. You would likely be hard pressed to find an ELCA minister who would take the eschatological passages in the major prophets or revelation as literal, like would be found in some forms of fundamentalism. The assumed position is amillennial, if by default, because nobody is talking about a millennium. Rick Barger writes in Living Lutheran, our hope in the promised eschaton takes seriously, but not always literally, the amazing images offered by the biblical poets. Despite the claims of the popular left-behind genre of theology, God does not pluck a select group of people from the earth, abscond with them to another place, and abandon the world. Rather, God comes and dwells with us, swallowing up death forever and bringing joy without end. In the meantime, a period in which we experience God's promised future already but not yet fully, we are to live as if God's reign were finally established. The ELCA is mostly opposed to Christian Zionism. A decent amount of space has been dedicated in the Journal of Lutheran Ethics over the years to discussing the matter. Also, ELCA Global Mission Continental Desk Director for Europe and the Middle East, Reverend Robert Smith, writes the following. We can boldly name Christian Zionism as a theology of glory that anticipates the destruction of all persons not adhering to its ideology. In it, there is no hope for reconciliation or the redemption of this world, only escape from it while it is cleansed through the unleashing of evil and its eventual cleansing by a returned warrior Christ. It is not a vision of hope, but a vision of injustice. It is a threat. I believe that we have something vital to say as Lutherans, both in response to the challenge of Christian Zionism and also in the larger sphere of North American religiosity. While there are still some in the ELCA who view homosexuality as sinful, this is not a position of the denomination. In September 2003, the Task Force for ELCA Studies on Sexuality presented the report Journey Together Faithfully, Part 2, The Church and Homosexuality, and a companion document, Background Essay on Biblical Texts for Journey Together Faithfully, Part 2, The Church and Homosexuality. The following is from the concluding statements of the latter document. As far as we can tell, the biblical writers knew nothing about homosexuality as a sexual orientation. The concepts of homosexuality, homosexual, heterosexuality, and heterosexual are modern, first articulated in the latter part of the 19th century. As strange as it may sound, it can be said that the Bible teaches nothing concerning homosexuality. Having said that, however, the Bible does have things to say about sexual relationships between men and women and between persons of the same gender. In regard to the latter, the fault line between interpreters is a narrow one, but it is very real. On the one hand, there are interpreters who, on reading the texts with care, conclude that even if the passages in Genesis 19 verses 1 through 11 and Judges 19 verses 16 through 30 are set aside, or at least placed on the periphery, the remaining passages speak clearly of same-gender sexual relationships as inherently prohibited. One need not narrow the matter down to any particular kind or kinds of same-gender sexual relationships. The relationships are themselves against nature and contrary to the will of God expressed in creation from the beginning. Other interpreters on reading the text with care also conclude, however, that the same passages pose challenges. Those in Leviticus seem to be the clearest at the purely descriptive level, but as the discussion above has shown, some interpreters question their relevance beyond their time and place. There is a broad consensus among interpreters that the term arsenokoitai, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 10, used by Paul and the author of the pastorals, is based on the two texts in Leviticus. That would not necessarily mean that the Leviticus passages are picked up as normative for Christians in the New Testament. It is possible that whoever coined the term, Paul or a predecessor, used it in a general way to refer to a specific type of same-gender activity that was highly visible and repugnant in his own time. In the final analysis, the etymology of a word is its history, not its meaning. The difference between interpreters should not be understood as a conflict between those who seek to be true to scripture and those who seek to twist the Bible to their own liking. The disagreements are genuine, nor is one approach intrinsically more conservative and the other more liberal. In 2009, the churchwide assembly voted on a 559 to 451 vote to open the ministry of the church to gay and lesbian pastors and other professional workers living in committed relationships. 
The same assembly adopted the 48-page document, A Social Statement on Human Sexuality, Gift, and Trust. After describing marriage between a man and woman, the statement goes on to say, Recognizing that this conclusion differs from the historic Christian tradition and the Lutheran confessions, some people, though not all, in this church and within the larger Christian community conclude that marriage is also the appropriate term to use in describing similar benefits, protection, and support for same-gender couples entering into lifelong monogamous relationships. The statement also says, This church opposes non-monogamous, promiscuous, or casual sexual relationships of any kind. Indulging immediate desires for satisfaction, sexual or otherwise, is to gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 through 19. Such transient encounters do not allow for trust in the relationship to create the context for trust in sexual intimacy. Despite that statement, some in the ELCA don't hold that viewpoint, such as ELCA Bishop Lila Ortiz, who has spoken positively and affirming of polyamory. In 2013, the first openly gay bishop was ordained in the ELCA, and in 2015, the first ordination of a transgender individual through the regular ordination process took place when Asher L. Callahan was ordained at House for All Sinners and Saints, the church pastored at the time by well-known ELCA pastor Nadia Bowles Weber. In the decades since the ELCA voted to allow openly gay and lesbian ordained ministers, many churches left over the issue. In the largest such exodus, the North American Lutheran Church, or NALC, was formed in 2010, with one of their doctrinal positions being disapproval of same-sex sexual relationships. There are now 424 churches and 142,000 members in the NALC. Today, the ELCA on the whole is open to the gay community. Banners on the denomination's website display the LGBT flag. The Lutheran Coalition for Renewal, an organization representing confessional Lutheranism and traditional viewpoints on human sexuality in recent years, has been denied from having booths at the denomination-wide ELCA assemblies. On June 24, 2020, ELCA presiding bishop Elizabeth Eaton said in a video honoring Pride Month, we celebrate all year round for the many gifts and the ways that this church and this country have been enriched by the gifts of LGBTQIA plus people. Our congregations are stronger. Our communities are more vibrant. There's still more work to be done, and we will do it. In the ELCA, divorce and remarriage are not covered in church documents, though some of the bodies that later merged into the ELCA addressed it. It may be said generally that a person getting divorced or remarried in the ELCA is not a matter of discipline and that the church would be permissive of it. In 1990, the ELCA produced a document called Visions and Expectations, a document on how clergy in the ELCA were to behave. It was modified a few times over the years. In March 2020, the ELCA voted to remove the document from use altogether. One of the reasons given was that vision and expectations has been misused as a juridical document and continues to be a source of great pain for many. One of the things covered in vision and expectations was divorce. The document said, an ordained minister who is married is expected to keep his or her marriage inviolate until death to cultivate love and respect for her or his spouse and to seek marital counseling when it is needed. It is recognized that due to human sin and brokenness, in some cases, the marital relationship may have to be dissolved. Should an ordained minister and spouse separate or seek to divorce, the counsel and guidance of the synodical bishop is to be sought. Similarly, should an ordained minister decide to marry following a divorce, the counsel and guidance of the synodical bishop is to be sought. It was also stated, It is in marriage that the highest degrees of physical intimacy are matched with and protected by the highest levels of binding commitment, including legal protection. It is in marriage that public promises of lifetime commitment can create the foundation for trust, intimacy, and safety. Single ordained ministers are expected to live a chaste life, holy in body and spirit, honoring the single life and working for the good of all. A married ordained minister is expected to live in fidelity to his or her spouse, giving expression to sexual intimacy within a marriage relationship that is mutual, chaste, and faithful. Today, views on sexuality by clergy can vary to a great degree. The church is no longer in a place where any position on human sexuality would lead to discipline. Listen to the following clip from ELCA minister Nadia Bowles Weber on the podcast A Tiny Revolution. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... It came out of my own experience. You know, I was raised, obviously, very, very fundamentalist Christian with all the crazy mm -hmm. about gender roles mm -hmm. and sex and, pre, you know, extramarital sex and all that. But it was before the purity movement, you know. 
But um, mm-hmm. I was raised with all that. Before we all kissed eating goodbye. Rejected it, you know, led mm-hmm. this very different life. But then I, I discovered the Lutheran Church. And, you know, the ELCA is one of the most progressive denominations in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And yet uh, there is a document you have to sign when you're ordained called Visions and Expectations that says mm-hmm. that you, you would be faithful in marriage. Or I think it's celibate or chaste in singleness. Well, the, um, yeah, cute. the origin of this document was it was originally sort of forged through the denomination by a group that was trying to keep the homosexuals out of the pulpit. Right. So it was a way of <laughs> it really was a way of keeping the homos down. And so mm-hmm. because you would have to be celibate in your singleness and gay people couldn't get married, you know, and then that shifted. And then they're like, oh, shit, right. But anyway, I had to, everybody has to sign this and it's insane because what happens is there are all these people who get married right out of seminary because they can't afford to live separately. You know, they need to, they need to live in intern housing. And so they get Mm -hmm. married sooner than they should, or they have sexual relationships that they are forced to keep secret or not be honest about or mm-hmm. they are completely repressed and we have, you know, single uh, grown <laughs> adults who don't have, who are not flourishing in their sexual lives because the church mm-hmm. says they shouldn't. So none of no. those things are great, really. Nope. And, um, and so, you know, I was, um, my ex-husband is a good man who would, who is in no way deserving of me ever saying anything Um, negative about him he's a great guy but we never connected like there was no intimacy in our marriage and Mm -hmm. for whatever reason it just didn't happen for us and so um you know people are like wow you don't do crossfit anymore i'm like i was doing crossfit because i wasn't having sex you know what i mean like it was just a way of like managing and now i'm like all soft and i got long hair and i'm so much happier you know uh but um (laughs) So yes. what happened was, uh, you know, I, I get divorced, like the most amicable divorce you can imagine. No lawyers, no acrimony. It was great, mm. right? It was actually really lovely. Um, but I, I, I get together with my boyfriend um, and start having sex. And it was like, holy shit. I was like, it felt like an exfoliation mm-hmm. of my whole spirit. I'm like, this is so good for my brain chemistry and my body and Mm -hmm. my heart and my i'm like man why in the world would the church say don't do this like i could tell it was what i needed and, and it was so good on abortion in 1991 the elca made a social statement on abortion which is still used today the statement says in part Induced abortion, the act of intentionally terminating a developing life in the womb, is one of the issues about which members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America have serious differences. These differences are also found within society. The statement also says, Because we believe that God is the creator of life, the number of induced abortions is a source of deep concern to this church. We mourn the loss of life that God has created. The strong Christian presumption is to preserve and protect life. Abortion ought to be an option only of last resort. Therefore, as a church, we seek to reduce the need to turn to abortion as the answer to unintended pregnancies. Later in the statement, it is also said, This church recognizes that there can be sound reasons for ending a pregnancy through induced abortion. Some of those reasons listed are rape, incest, threat to the woman's life, or extreme fetal abnormality. The statement also says, This church opposes ending intrauterine life when a fetus is developed enough to live outside a uterus with the aid of reasonable and necessary technology. On the legality of abortion, it is said in the statement, What is legal is not necessarily moral, and what is moral should not necessarily be enacted into law. Members of this church hold different opinions about the role and extent of public law and regulation in relation to abortion. The spectrum of disagreement ranges from those who believe all abortions should be prohibited by law except to save the life of the mother, to those who oppose any law seeking to regulate abortion except to protect the health and safety of the woman. The position of this church is that government has a legitimate role in regulating abortion. Because of our conviction that both the life of the woman and the life in her womb must be respected by law, this church opposes the total lack of regulation of abortion, legislation that would outlaw abortion in all circumstances, 
laws that prevent access to information about all options available to women faced with unintended pregnancies, laws that deny access to safe and affordable services for morally justifiable abortions, mandatory or coerced abortion or sterilization, laws that prevent couples from practicing contraception, and laws that are primarily intended to harass those contemplating or deciding for an abortion. The 2014 Pew Research Center Religious Landscape study found that 65% of ELCA members polled were in favor of abortion being legal in all or most cases, and 32% believed it should be illegal in all or most cases. ELCA churches can vary in worship style. The ELCA document How is Worship Traditional? How is Worship Contemporary? offers the following guidance. Much debate and conflict has affected the church when it comes to what changes in worship and what stays the same. This has been true especially in the so-called worship wars. The two camps have been given the unfortunate labels traditional and contemporary. On the positive side, such wars have happened because the church as a whole genuinely cares about its worship. We often disagree most fiercely over things that matter the most to us. Some assemblies will continue to worship with predominantly one style at one service and another style at another service. Sometimes the arrangement is very practical in nature. It might be easier to ask musical leaders to participate in one service on a weekend rather than two or more. Yet one must always consider how the entire assembly is exploring the richness of multiple musical expressions. Music from all styles can be welcome in worship. What is central is that the musical style serves the gospel. It is not the music, finally, that is central. The music points to the assembly gathered around word, bath, and table. The voice of the assembly is the primary instrument in worship. Both organs and praise bands can obscure this. Both can support and uplift it. Encourage participation rather than performance. Musical leadership serves the assembly when it strives for participation by the whole assembly. Involve all ages in all kinds of music. Refrain from making assumptions about musical preference based on age. While it cannot be said that the ELCA is opposed to alcohol, as it has not made any statements prohibiting its use, and the Lutheran tradition has historically been one where drinking alcohol has been accepted, the ELCA does have a practice of screening investments it makes and has made a policy on investment in production or marketing of alcohol. The document Alcohol, Social Criteria Investment Screen says, Given its inordinate effect on life expectancy, alcohol abuse represents a public health issue. Historically, the ELCA's predecessors have expressed concern about the widespread misuse of alcohol. The ELCA shall not knowingly make any investment in firms which are involved in, e.g. 10% or more of revenue is derived from, the production or marketing of alcohol products for human consumption. On the whole, the ELCA does not teach a necessary or required tithe, that is, giving 10% of one's income to the church. However, there are those in the church that do tithe. Margaret Payne, writing in the Journal of Lutheran Ethics in 2012, said, Slavish adherence to any legalistic requirement can fool us into thinking that we are earning holiness and blind us to the reality that our law-keeping might actually stand in the way of spiritual growth. And yet the tithe, as a spiritual discipline, is vastly underappreciated by modern Lutherans. I believe that if we boldly reintroduce the challenge to tithe, personally embrace the conviction of its worth, and then do it, we will provide abundant resources for God's work in the world as well as invigorate our experience of life in Christ. In 2016, the ELCA voted 751 to 162 to call on the U.S. government to end all financial and military aid to Israel until Israel, quote, complies with internationally recognized human rights standards, freezes settlement construction on occupied Palestinian land, and for the church to adopt an investment screen to avoid profiting from Israel's occupation. Let's now discuss the church polity of the ELCA. First, let me clarify that many completely independent Lutheran denominations call themselves synods, such as Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, Evangelical Lutheran Synod, or Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Despite this, those bodies are totally independent denominations, just like the ELCA is. The ELCA uses the word synod to refer to a district or geographical area. There are 65 synods in the ELCA. Each synod has a governing bishop. Churches may call their own ministers with help of the synod and may leave the ELCA altogether, taking property with them if the church votes to do so by a two-thirds majority. Every three years, the ELCA holds a church-wide assembly. This is the primary decision-making body and consists of voting members, both ordained and laypersons, from the congregations. The church holds to belief in the priesthood of all believers, although some within the ELCA were worried that this would be compromised when the ELCA entered full communion with the Episcopal Church and consented to following apostolic succession practices in installing bishops. 
Deacons are ordained, both men and women. This is not necessarily a transitional role to another office. An ordained minister is typically called by the title of pastor. Most pastors serve in local congregations. Bishops serve as senior pastors over synods in six-year terms, which may be renewed. The idea of a bishop no longer being a bishop clashed with the apostolic succession view of Anglicanism at the full communion agreement with the Episcopal Church. This was resolved in the document used to certify the agreement, titled Called to Common Mission, which says on the matter, The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America agrees that all its bishops chosen after both churches pass this concordat will be installed for pastoral service of the gospel with this church's intention to enter the ministry of the historic episcopate. They will be understood by the Episcopal Church as having been ordained into this ministry, even though tenure in office of the presiding bishop and synodical bishops may be terminated by retirement, resignation, disciplinary action, or conclusion of term. Any subsequent installation of a bishop so installed includes a prayer for the gift of the Holy Spirit without the laying on of hands. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America further agrees to revise its right for the installation of a bishop to reflect this understanding. Both men and women may serve in any role within the church, including pastors, deacons, and as bishops. The current presiding bishop of the ELCA is a woman. Clergy may be married at all levels to any person of any gender. The ELCA is also part of the Lutheran World Federation, National Council of Churches, and World Council of Churches. This chart from the ELCA shows membership trends from 1988 when the denomination was formed through 2015. You can notice an increase in the decline when many churches broke off in 2009 over the issue of homosexuality. According to this chart from the ELCA, in 1990 there were 65 ELCA megachurches defined by having 801 or more members. That increased to 74 by 1995, then 81 in 2000, and still at 80 in 2005. But in 2010, there were only 56 and only 41 in 2017. The same chart shows the number of churches with 351 to 800 members declining from 717 to 241, and churches with 151 to 350 members going from over 2,900 to only 1,200. Meanwhile, in 1990, only 1,957 churches were in the small category with only 1 to 50 members. The 2017 numbers show 3,676 churches in that category. This chart shows the year of origin for ELCA churches. The vast majority are older than the denomination itself, originating from previous Lutheran church bodies. A large number predate the 1930s, and there was a boom of church plants from around 1950 through 1970. Recent decades are seeing very few lasting churches. So far, we've taken on two heavy-hitting videos on Lutheran denominations. It's time for a bit of a break as we watch a lighter fare video on some other Lutheran denominations, the ones that are unusual. Here's the discussion of Lutheran outliers. If you go to any video that tries to tell you what any denomination teaches, you're probably going to find some thumbs down and some comments that say that's not true. Let's take Lutherans as an example. Lutherans believe that baptism saves. But if you say this, there's bound to be someone who says, my Lutheran church doesn't teach that baptism saves. And that's true. There are some that don't. But they aren't the churches that represent the mainstream of Lutheranism. They're the churches that are the exceptions within Lutheranism. So it's still not inaccurate to say that Lutherans do believe that baptism saves. Of course, it's also important, if one says that, that they clarify that Lutherans don't believe baptism works ex opere operato, but that's not what this video is about. In this video, we're going to look at a few exceptions to the rule. Lutherans normally don't believe these things, but here's some Lutherans that do. Whatever you do, don't get your view of what Lutherans believe from this video. We're talking about the exceptions, and we're also talking on a denominational level. These same beliefs are doubtless taught in pockets of other Lutheran denominations, but there are actually whole denominations that have a bit of an unusual flavor for Lutheranism. Also, we're talking about American Lutherans, so some things may be more common elsewhere, and we're talking about modern Lutherans. Some of these positions that are outliers were much more common in the past. So let's talk about these Lutheran outliers. Let's start with Charismatic Lutherans. they are more outliers today than they have been in the last 50 years. Lutheranism has never been very charismatic, but the charismatic movement did affect Lutheran churches, and there was a movement that had some steam for a while. It was called Lutheran Renewal, 
and there were conferences, newsletters, and websites. In 2013, though, the last conference was held. Probably the most influential name in the movement, Lutheran pastor Larry Christensen, died in 2017. The largest U.S. Lutheran denomination, the ELCA, held most of this movement for a while. However, it has dwindled away there. Today, most of what is left is within the Alliance of Renewal Churches, which allows churches to join while they're part of other denominations. Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ is the main denomination today that ARC churches are part of, and the LCMC seems to be the most open Lutheran denomination to charismatic expression, with even their current top denominational leader being previously the leader of the ARC. And now, let's look at another outlier. Take a look at this statement. We hold to the King James Version of 1611 because it is by far the most reliable and faithful English translation of the Bible. We are opposed to the usage of new translations because all of those of which we have knowledge err seriously in basic doctrinal points. If you heard that in isolation, you'd probably presume that it came from a Baptist, since the majority of KJV-only churches in the U.S. today are Baptist. But no, that's part of the constitution of the Illinois Lutheran Conference, a small, and I mean small, Lutheran denomination. The denomination formed in the 1970s when a few ministers were suspended from the radio program they had been teachers on because of their stance on this very issue, Bible versions. The pastors eventually left their whole denomination, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, and in 1979, the ILC was founded. It grew from the two pastors and their churches all the way up to six, before declining to the present three churches. A denomination that stands out in a few ways from the rest of Lutheranism in America is the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. They're the eighth largest Lutheran denomination in the U.S. with 116 churches. One way they stand out as outliers is their eschatology. The CLB website says the CLB has historically affirmed the premillennial views. Another thing that makes the CLB stand out is their belief on confessing membership. In most Lutheran denominations, you become a baptized member as an infant and then go through confirmation, and there's nothing more. Adults might join through transfer, baptism if unbaptized, or be accepted after catechesis. Lutheran brethren were very affected by the Lutheran pietist movement, and one of the results is that they expect members to have a conversion experience. Because of this, even after confirmation, there is one more step to what is called confessing membership, for which there is the following requirement. All applicants must confess that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as God's only way of salvation, and that they have personally received this salvation based on faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. From the CLB, we turn to the opposite side of American Lutheranism. The idea of universal salvation is not foreign to Lutheranism, as there is doubtless a pretty large chunk of the ELCA that holds to universalism or to a view of the unknowability of judgment and hopeful of universal salvation. ELCA theologian Carl Broughton has been positively quoted on the ELCA website where it said, ELCA Lutherans will say with Broughton, this hope for the final salvation of humanity and the eternal universal restitution of all things in heaven and on earth is drawn from the unlimited promise of the gospel and the magnitude of God's grace made known to the world through Christ. That being said, there are also plenty of non-universalists in the ELCA today. So universalism itself is not an outlier view today in mainline Lutheranism, but for a Lutheran denomination to have universal reconciliation as its official position would be. In comes the General Lutheran Church, which states that it not only unapologetically confesses its belief in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and two sacraments, but also the final harmony of all souls with God. In telling their history, which began in 2014 and today leaves them with five churches, they say that they expanded Martin Luther's statement regarding the possibility of universal reconciliation into the adoption of a belief in the final harmony of all souls with God. We also base this belief on a number of New Testament scriptures. And speaking of universalism, we come to another Lutheran outlier group, the small denomination that goes by the acronym ELDONA, the Evangelical Lutheran Diocese of North America. Aldona and its 28 churches are the sole Lutheran denomination in the U.S. to come out in opposition to the doctrine of objective justification, sometimes termed universal objective justification, which is a major soteriological position of most of American confessional Lutheranism. Some have claimed that objective justification borders too closely on universalism. Here's part of the Wells' description of the doctrine. Because of the substitutionary work of Christ, 
God has justified all people, that is, God has declared them to be not guilty. This forms the firm, objective basis for the sinner's assurance of salvation. Unbelievers forfeit the forgiveness won for them by Christ. In Eldona's 2013 thesis on the subject, they said, This teaching is not only dangerous in its grossest abuse, crass universalism, but is in itself contrary to God's word and the exhibition of the same by the symbols of Christ's church. With that position, this small denomination becomes an outlier among American Lutheran denominations. Another Lutheran outlier in several ways is the group of Lutherans known as the Laestadians or Apostolic Lutherans. The Laestadian Lutheran Church has 36 congregations, the Apostolic Lutheran Church of America has 52, and the Old Apostolic Lutheran Church has 32. And how are they outliers? Well, here's some quotes from the Laestadian Lutheran Church website. The prevention of conception or birth control is contrary to God's word and good conscience. It contradicts the teaching of God's word with regard to both creation and marriage. Television. Due to bad programming, this should not be in a believing home. Sports. Competitive sports are not acceptable, but we should maintain fitness through various forms of exercise. Women don't use cosmetics, and they also teach abstinence from alcohol, which is not a very common Lutheran position either. Most Laestadian churches also use the King James Version from the pulpit. A lesser known and newer denomination than the LCMS and ELCA is the moderate denomination Lutheran Congregations in Mission for Christ. Let's learn about them next. Lutheran Congregations in Mission for Christ, or LCMC, is a denomination with 960 churches that was founded in 2001 from more moderate congregations breaking away from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or ELCA. Since its founding, churches have joined from many other bodies, including independent Lutherans and churches leaving the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod as well. The main catalyst for the formation of the LCMC was the ELCA's adoption of Called to Common Mission, a document for full communion with the Episcopal Church, in which the ELCA, to complete the agreement, modified their church polity to accommodate apostolic succession and the historic Anglican view of the episcopate. Since then, the ELCA has also made denomination-wide pronouncements on human sexuality that the LCMC also opposes. The LCMC is made up of districts, some of which are geographical, but others are theological in nature, and so some churches will join districts that have taken certain positions on the issues. We'll be referencing these district statements as well as the denomination-wide positions as we explain the LCMC. Churches may be part of more than one district or none at all. Many LCMC churches have been part of other denominations while also part of the LCMC, and their website says, we're not a denomination, we're a movement. Here's a bit more on that from the LCMC. Some have said LCMC is a vibrant and faithful association of congregations rather than a denominational church body. LCMC has referred to itself as a post-denominational association of congregations as a way of acknowledging that its horizontal structure is different than the more vertical structure of many classic denominations. But having said that, LCMC is recognized as a church body denomination by the IRS, by the ELCA, and by other denominations. LCMC does have structure that is defined in its constitution and bylaws. LCMC has member congregations, association-wide meetings, a clergy list, roster, a retirement and health plan, and regional and otherwise configured districts for congregational support. LCMC does endorse chaplains for the military and its pensions and health plans transfer. Seminary students have a candidacy process and clergy a certification process. While we understand our association to be post-denominational, we are a denomination by most societal definitions. The freedom we enjoy allows us a variety of ways of saying who we are. We are primarily Lutheran congregations in mission for Christ. The LCMC What We Believe page on their website tells us about their position on the Lutheran creeds and confessions. We accept the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creeds as true declarations of the scriptural faith we believe, teach, and confess. We believe, teach, and accept the unaltered Augsburg Confession and the Small Catechism as true witnesses to the Word of God, normative for our teaching and practice. We acknowledge that we are one in faith and doctrine with all churches that likewise accept the teachings of the unaltered Augsburg Confession. We believe, teach, and confess the other confessional writings in the Book of Concord, namely, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the Small Called Articles, the Treatise, the Large Catechism, and the Formula of Concord as further valid expositions of the Holy Scriptures. 
As we'll discuss later when we talk about the LCMC's polity, they are a group of congregations with very little above them structurally. There aren't at this point a list of statements on issues made by the denomination and very little in the way of requirements beyond the creeds. This makes it difficult to speak about the group as a whole because there can be a lot of diversity. As a result, I often will be looking all the way down to the local congregation level to give you a picture into what the LCMC churches believe. On some of the most major doctrines of Christianity, LCMC congregations would affirm the Trinity, deity of Christ, virgin birth, resurrection of Christ, and a literal heaven and hell. The LCMC has no additional denominational position on the sacraments than is found in the confessions they affirm. Like most confessional Lutherans, baptism and the Lord's Supper are primarily in view, but absolution is also practiced in some churches. The Apology of the Augsburg Confession states, Therefore, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and absolution, which is the sacrament of repentance, are truly sacraments. For baptism, LCMC churches practice baptism primarily for infants, but also for unbaptized converts. The mode is usually sprinkling, although other modes are not invalid or unacceptable. LCMC views on the role of baptism in salvation can vary. Living Christ's Mission Church, which also has the acronym LCMC, clever, says on their website, we believe that the new birth of the believer comes only through faith in Christ and that repentance is a vital part of believing. Repentance is not in itself a separate and independent condition of salvation, nor are any other acts such as confession, baptism, prayer, faithful service, or manifestation of certain spiritual gifts to be added to believing as a condition of salvation. St. Michael Lutheran Church of Canton's website says, We practice both infant and adult baptism. We believe baptism in the name of Jesus is God's outward, visible sign of the covenant he desires for all. We do not believe that baptism saves. Only faith in Jesus has salvation consequences. Pastor John Hopper of Christ Lutheran Church, Maple Plain, Minnesota, has written, How is it you entered into God's presence, into his family? Yes, in holy baptism. Through this precious gift of water and the Holy Spirit, God adopted you into the glorious family called the Church. You became a member of the communion of saints. Remember that the waters of baptism are your salvation. Peter says that baptism now saves you. You are God's redeemed child now as you remember that you have been washed in the waters of baptism. Most LCMC churches practice confirmation and offer confirmation classes leading up to it. In the Lord's Supper, alcoholic wine is the usual element of the cup, though many congregations provide grape juice as well. For example, Faith Lutheran Church in Moline, Illinois says on their website, All who believe that Christ is present in the bread and wine are welcome to receive communion. Grape juice is available for those desiring it, as well as gluten-free hosts. LCMC congregations affirm the confessional view of the real presence of Christ in the elements, truly present in, with, and under the elements of the bread and wine. The LCMC does not set a requirement on churches as far as who they should allow to participate in communion. For example, Sychar Lutheran Church and LCMC congregation states on their website, Sychar has an open communion policy. One needs not be a member or even necessarily a Lutheran to commune with us. Our communion participation is a matter of individual conscience, whereby one determines both their need for God's grace and Christ's presence within the bread and wine as means to receive this grace. Likewise, Faith Lutheran Church Albuquerque states, All adult Christians are invited to participate in Holy Communion, along with children who are prepared through our Welcome to the Lord's Table classes. Faith Lutheran Church in Moline, Illinois, in the quote a moment ago, requires affirmation of the real presence of Christ in the elements for participation. The LCMC Statement of Faith confirms their view on the canon of Scripture, saying, We believe, teach, and accept the canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the inspired Word of God and the sole authoritative source and norm of our proclamation, faith, and life. Most LCMC churches never read from or discuss the Apocrypha, but since Luther himself said they are good to read, you may occasionally find an LCMC church that will mention them, but not as inspired scripture. Notably, the word inerrant is not in the LCMC position on the Bible. This may be because of the baggage that comes with using the word, such as those who claim that those who hold to inerrancy must also have only men as pastors, or must believe in a literal six-day creation, and so on. Many LCMC churches have statements on the scriptures that claim lack of error, but don't use the word inerrant. For example, Living Christ Mission Church's website says, We believe in the divine inspiration of the scriptures. The whole Bible is inspired in the sense that through the Holy Spirit of God, people were instructed to write the very words of scripture. This divine inspiration extends equally and fully to all parts of the writings as they appeared in the original manuscripts. Therefore, the whole Bible in the originals is without error. As the revelation of God, we believe the Bible to be the sole authority and sufficiency with regard to Christian faith and practice. Faith Lutheran Church in Bloomington, Illinois puts it this way, We believe the entire Bible is the inspired word of God and that people were moved by the Spirit of God to write the very words of Scripture. 
Therefore, we believe the Bible is entirely accurate, reliable, and complete. Other LCMC churches are explicit in their belief in inerrancy. For example, Hosanna Lutheran Church in Watertown, South Dakota. Their website states, The Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. The term inspired means that the Bible in the original documents is God-breathed, divine, and because it is divine, the documents are inerrant. 2 Timothy 3.16 Inerrancy means that if all scripture is indeed of God, then it cannot be erroneous. God, being perfect, cannot make mistakes, and he has the power to ensure the original writers wrote down exactly what he intended. 2 Peter 1.21 Infallible has a stronger meaning than inerrant. Infallible means the Bible is incapable of error. Infallibility means it cannot contain errors. That is, it would not be possible. The Bible cannot contain errors because it is wholly the inspired word of God, 2 Peter 1.19. Because of the freedom left in the LCMC official statement, there may also be LCMC churches that would not claim inerrancy. What about belief in a literal Adam and Eve as the first humans, or belief in human evolution and various creation theories such as theistic evolution, day-age theory, old earth, and young earth creation? The LCMC puts no requirements on what churches believe or teach in these areas, other than that the church must be able to align what they teach with the statement on the Bible. Likely, there is a diversity of views in the LCMC on these issues. LCMC churches affirm original sin. For example, Living Christ Mission Church says on their website, We believe that humankind was originally created in the image of and after the likeness of God. Adam and Eve fell through sin and as a consequence of their sin lost their spiritual life. Becoming dead in trespasses and sins, they became subject to the power of the devil. This spiritual death or total depravity of human nature has been transmitted to the entire human race, Christ Jesus alone being exempted. Thus, every child of Adam and Eve is born into the world with a sinful nature, original sin, which not only possesses no spark of divine life, but is essentially and unchangeably sinful apart from divine grace. As a sacramental denomination in which most congregations would teach that the sacraments are a means of grace, most churches would not teach a one-time, born-again experience as the only salvific action. However, the more evangelical wing of churches in the LCMC will be the closest to this viewpoint. For example, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Sandy, Utah says, We become right with God through faith in God's atoning sacrifice for all sin in Jesus Christ on the cross. Through faith we receive Christ's righteousness and are justified before God, the Father, and are born again children of God. Faith is the result of hearing, believing, and trusting the good news of forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. LCMC churches deny that works are necessary for salvation. You will likely find, if the subject comes up, that most LCMC Lutherans, along with confessional Lutherans generally, affirm total depravity. As for the other four points of Calvinism, things can vary, but most in the LCMC are likely to deny the other four points. Faith Lutheran Church Albuquerque says on the Beliefs page of their website, We believe and teach that God desires for all people to be saved, rejecting the idea that some people are predestined to be saved and others are predestined to be lost. Some LCMC churches teach that salvation cannot be lost, while others do not. For example, Pastor Christopher Byers of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Washington, Indiana writes on the church's blog, Personally, I am a Lutheran and agree with the belief that once the Holy Spirit has captured your heart, there is no escape. I also believe that it is promised to you in the waters of baptism by our Lord and our God given by him in his holy word when he claims you in those waters of baptism, as Paul says in Romans 6. Red Hill Lutheran Church in Tustin, California says on the Mission and Philosophy page of their website, We believe that all the redeemed once saved are kept by God's power and are thus secure in Christ forever. Entire sanctification, as taught by holiness churches, is not a doctrine taught in the LCMC. The LCMC is accepting of charismatic Lutheran churches. For example, Resurrection Lutheran Church in Charlotte, North Carolina tells about their history. The first major change came in the early 1970s when, under the leadership of Pastor Herb Murley, the church embraced the charismatic renewal and the present-day working of the Holy Spirit. Members enthusiastically adopted a new identity as faith-filled spiritual pioneers contending for the gospel in a rapidly changing world. Resurrection Church soon found itself on the leading edge of various spiritual innovations, including the incorporation of contemporary music, dance, drama, and the arts into worship services. At the time, the church was part of the LCMS, but they joined the LCMC in 2018. The charismatic movement touched Lutheranism, and one small organization formed was the Alliance of Renewal Churches, or ARC. The ARC says the following about their identity. We are a network of leaders and congregations that embraces a convergence of the evangelical, sacramental, and charismatic streams of the Christian faith, celebrates, not merely tolerates, the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, 
manifests a healthy disregard for the impossible, is united by shared vision, mission, and values, is kingdom-focused while appreciating a shared Lutheran heritage. This is relevant because there are churches in the LCMC that are also part of the Alliance of Renewal Churches, such as Light of Christ Church in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin, and Redeemer Lutheran Church in Fridley, Minnesota. In fact, the current service coordinator of the LCMC as of August 2020 is Mike Bradley, who is the director of the Alliance of Renewal Churches until this year. The service coordinator is essentially the director or president of the LCMC by another name. Here's Mike on the That Podcast from Atonement Church in Fargo, North Dakota, explaining his story. And I went home to, uh, after serving four years, went home to Omaha, Nebraska, began to work in a Christian bookstore, Zondervan Family Bookstores, uh, kind of moved up the ranks there to manager and then regional manager. And one day a, a guy walked into my store and uh, kind of reminded me of Friar Tuck. Uh, extended his hand because we could still shake hands back then and uh, said, hi, I'm Al Asper. I'm a, I'm a Lutheran pastor here in town. And this was back in the 70s. So you, you had to go to a bookstore to get your books. No Amazon, no internet. I, hi, Pastor Asper. How are you? And we began talking. And at one point he asked if I would begin carrying some books in my store that were by Pentecostal authors, Assembly of God authors, charismatic authors. And I asked him, well, I, excuse me, but I, I thought you said you were a Lutheran pastor. And he said, I am. And I said, well, what's a Lutheran pastor wanting with these books from Pentecostal authors? And he said, well, I'm a Lutheran pastor who believes that the Holy Spirit is alive and well today. And I thought about it for a minute and found myself saying out loud to him, you can't be that. <laughs> <laughs> You can you can be Lutheran, or you can be uh, charismatic. You can be one who believes in the, the empowering presence of the Spirit, but you can't be both. He said, oh, would you like to talk about that? Sure. We began to meet for coffee, and we looked at some scriptures that the, the folks who had discipled me had, not maliciously, but had misinterpreted and misapplied. And then one day I asked him, well, Pastor Al, what's it mean to be Lutheran? And he began to share with me some of the best of our Lutheran theological heritage. And I said, well, that's just good scripture. A link to the full podcast is in the video description. The fact that Mike is now the LCMC service coordinator shows that there is certainly room in the LCMC for those with charismatic theology. The largest church in the LCMC, the multi-site Hosanna Church in the Minneapolis, Minnesota metro, is also part of the Alliance of Renewal Churches. On eschatology or end times, the LCMC doesn't have a requirement on a millennial view, but Lutherans today are generally amillennial. Faith Lutheran Church Albuquerque says on their website, We affirm the words of the Apostles' Creed that Christ will come again to judge both the living and the dead, and we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We avoid what we view to be speculative teachings concerning the end times. As Christians, we believe that every day is an opportunity to live in a vital, loving, and growing relationship with God. We do not fear the future. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8.39 by the time that the LCMC was founded, the ELCA had long been moving toward acceptance of homosexuality, and doubtless the leaving of the churches who formed the LCMC and others over the years only increased the percentage of the ELCA that were in favor of gay marriage and full inclusion of homosexuals in ministry. Although the main issue that formed the LCMC was not this one, early on in their formation in 2001, they made a statement called a pastoral admonition. We affirm that God created us male and female, and that it is God's will and intention that human sexual expression and fulfillment take place only within the boundaries of marriage between one man and one woman, Genesis 2, 24-25, Matthew 19, 4-6, and Mark 10, 2-9. And we confess as individuals and congregations that we have not fulfilled God's will in our decisions, modeling, and teaching. The LCMC takes no stance on divorce and remarriage, so responses and practices will vary from congregation to congregation. On abortion, though the LCMC as a whole doesn't have a stated position, there is a statement that they put on their website, not as a position of the denomination, but that any church leaders could choose for themselves to put a signature to. In part, the statement says, The various Lutheran church bodies in the United States do not take a hard and fast position on contraceptives, as our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church do, but many of us do share the same beliefs about the sanctity of human life. Because of this conviction about the sanctity of life, we are outraged over the mandatory 
mandatory inclusion of various forms of morning after pills that have the intended consequence of ending the life of a conceived human embryo. Additionally, the LCMC has a page on their website for congregational resources that they describe in this way. The congregational resources listed on our website are offered for your consideration. They are listed here because they are currently offered by one of our LCMC congregations or pastors or have been used by one of our congregations or pastors. Each ministry comes with a letter of recommendation. That they are listed does not imply an endorsement by the Board of Trustees, the Ministry Board, or the staff of LCMC. One of the recommended resources is Lutherans for Life, a pro-life organization. St. Michael Lutheran Church of Canton says on their website, We also believe that children are a blessing from the Lord. Thus, all human life is sacred and worthy of protection from the moment of conception. It is safe to say that in general, the LCMC is made up of pro-life churches. More systematized and traditionally conservative Lutheran groups like the Missouri Synod are seeing more and more contemporary worship practiced in their churches, with some opposition. The LCMC, with their freedom views on matters like this, is even more diverse, with many churches having a more evangelical feel than the liturgical or traditional feel of Lutheran worship in decades gone by. Many churches offer both traditional and contemporary services, and some will have only one or the other or a more blended style of worship. Churches in the LCMC are not opposed to the responsible consumption of alcohol. Some LCMC congregations teach tithing or giving 10% of one's income to the church. For example, Atonement Lutheran Church in Fargo, North Dakota says, Jesus calls us to follow him in a life of discipleship. As we grow and mature in our faith, we come to see that God continues to work in our hearts and in our lives. We teach the marks of discipleship, daily prayer, weekly worship, Bible reading, service, relationship with other believers, and faithful stewardship, tithing. Trinity Lutheran Church in Bianco, Texas says, Trinity Lutheran Church believes in Christian tithing, regularly dedicating a portion of one's income to the work of God. Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Story City, Iowa says, tithing is encouraged. The polity of the LCMC is congregational. Congregations are independently governed. The LCMC says, Congregations have direct representation in the affairs of the association. Each congregation is entitled to delegates that represent them at the yearly gathering and convention. Congregations maintain complete control over their property. Congregations determine how they will call their next pastor and who it will be. They deal directly with the pastoral candidates. LCMC provides a structure and a network of like-minded churches through districts. These districts are either geographic or non-geographic. Congregations have significant latitude in ordering and shaping ministry in their local setting, and we intentionally have made joining and leaving the association simple. We have also agreed to a disciplinary process for addressing congregations whose actions violate our agreed-upon statements of faith and practice. The LCMC affirms priesthood of all believers and allows individual congregations to choose their own ministers. They say, this association affirms the priesthood of all believers. It commits itself in function and structure to equip and support all members of its congregations for their ministries within and outside of the household of faith. It is within and from this context of ministry that we declare that we are called by God to the public ministry of the word and sacrament and other specific ministries. At the same time, all baptized members of our congregations are priests called by God to ministries in their daily lives. The primary ordained office is that of pastor. The LCMC does not have any statements on deacons, so local churches will handle their roles within the congregation. There are no bishops above pastors. The LCMC is not opposed to the ordination of women. The Epiphany District of the LCMC said in their booklet, LCMC, A New Way to Reaffirm the Truth of God's Word, LCMC supports and upholds the pastoral ministries of the men and women called to serve the church. This is a large part of the reason why LCMC needed to be created. We could not deny the call of so many women as pastors, which other Lutheran bodies do. We could not continue to foster the notion that clergy were better than lay people, which other Lutheran bodies do. In LCMC, we all serve God equally. Some congregations in the LCMC may have constitutions or bylaws that only allow men to serve as pastor, which is permissible. Other churches ordain women. Clergy in the LCMC are free to marry. There is no requirement of celibacy. The LCMC is not part of any associations, such as the International Lutheran Council, Confessional Evangelical Lutheran Conference, Lutheran World Federation, or National Association of Evangelicals, World Council of Churches, or National Council of Churches. In 2001, there were 25 charter congregations of the LCMC. At the second national convention in 2002, the number was 62. In 2004, there were 105. In 2007, 210. In 2010, 550. In 2013, 700. And 960 as of 2020. 
The LCMC is the fourth largest Lutheran church body in the USA, behind the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America with 9,091, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod with 6,046, and the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod with 1,276 churches, and ahead of the newer North American Lutheran Church founded in 2010 and with 424 churches, and the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations with 255 churches. All right, so you've watched the videos on the LCMS, ELCA, and now LCMC. Review is helpful for cementing information in your mind, so let's take on a seven-minute fast-paced comparison between these three denominations. Today, we are comparing three Lutheran denominations in the United States. They are the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or ELCA, Lutheran Congregations in Mission for Christ, or LCMC, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, or LCMS. As far as the size of these denominations, the ELCA is the largest in America, followed by the LCMS. The number three denomination is the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, or WELS, and the LCMC is number four. I'm covering the first, second, and fourth largest denominations today, and not the WELS for the following reasons. The ELCA is the clear representative for mainline Lutheranism, not affirming inerrancy and often willing to buck the confessions. The LCMS is the largest confessional Lutheran body in the USA, and the LCMC is a moderate denomination with positions between those two. The WELS is slightly more conservative than the LCMS, so we'll discuss its differences at a later time. The ELCA was formed from three other Lutheran denominations merging together in 1988. The LCMC started in 2001 from churches leaving the ELCA, though today many LCMC-affiliated churches were never ELCA churches, and the LCMS originates in 1847, at the time a combination of mostly German Lutheran immigrant congregations. Before we get deep into the comparison of the ELCA, LCMC, and LCMS, let me make you aware that there are separate, more lengthy videos on this channel that clearly explain the position of each denomination on all of the issues that I am discussing here. If you want sources and a deeper discussion of the individual points that I'll be quickly comparing in this video, you'll find that information in those videos. On doctrines such as the Trinity, Deity of Christ, Virgin Birth, and Literal Resurrection of Christ, the LCMC and LCMS affirm them completely and congregations or ministers that did not affirm them would run the risk of expulsion. In the ELCA, though in most cases these doctrines are also affirmed, there are cases in all of these areas where some ELCA ministers deny these, and they are allowed to remain as ELCA ministers. As far as sacraments go, all three denominations are sacramental, not believing in only ordinances. The ELCA holds to baptism and communion, and most LCMC and LCMS churches would also only practice those two. However, absolution is also an acceptable Lutheran sacrament, so some churches practice it. Although none of the three churches view immersion or pouring to be invalid modes of baptism, sprinkling is the common mode in each of them. All three churches baptize infants primarily, but unbaptized adult converts are also baptized. On confirmation, it is widely practiced in the ELCA, LCMC, and LCMS, with the ELCA particularly commonly using the terminology of affirmation of baptism. On the Lord's Supper, the elements are wine and bread. LCMS literature speaks negatively of using unfermented grape juice, while there are congregations that do so in the ELCA and LCMC, although wine is still most common. On whether the bread should be leavened or unleavened, the ELCA allows either, the LCMS position is to use unleavened, and the LCMC doesn't have a required position for churches. As for who can participate in communion, in the ELCA it is open communion, so even non-Lutherans who are non-Christians can participate in communion in many churches. In the LCMC, each church sets their own standard. Open communion is common here, though many would want the communicant to be a professed Christian and others would require them to be Lutheran. The LCMS restricts participation to members in other LCMS churches and to members in church bodies the LCMS is in altar fellowship with, such as the AALC. All three denominations believe in a 66-book biblical canon. The Apocrypha is not viewed as scripture, but the ELCA does have some apocryphal readings in its newest lectionary. On inerrancy, the ELCA does not hold to inerrancy, the LCMS does, and the LCMC mostly does too, though the actual word inerrant is not used, perhaps to avoid some of the assumptions that come along with using the term. On creation and evolution, most in the ELCA affirm human evolution as opposed to special creation. The LCMS officially holds to a literal six-day creation and rejects human evolution, and the LCMC doesn't have any requirements, so likely a lot of the middle views between these two sides would be present. All three denominations affirm original sin, though in the ELCA the meaning of that in many congregations may be interpreted in different ways. 
None of the three denominations teach salvation as being a one-time crisis or born-again experience, though there are some in the LCMC who teach that. The LCMS teaches against that viewpoint. In the LCMS and most churches in the other two denominations, baptism is viewed as a part of salvation, as a sacrament bringing salvation grace, but not absolutely required for salvation. None of the denominations are Calvinistic, holding to unconditional election or limited atonement. None teach the holiness doctrine of entire sanctification. Churches in the ELCA are not forbidden from being charismatic, but in practice, this has mostly died out in the denomination since the charismatic renewal of the 1970s. The LCMC has retained and gained some of these charismatic Lutheran churches, which are welcome, though most churches in the LCMC are not charismatic. The LCMS is mostly opposed to charismatism. In all three denominations, you'll find them to nearly all be amillennial. It's the stated position of the LCMS, and the other two don't require that view, but it still prevails. On homosexuality and gay marriage, the ELCA supports the LGBT movement and allows homosexuals to serve openly in the church and to be married in the church, though not every congregation is in favor. The LCMC and LCMS both proclaim homosexuality as sinful and oppose ordaining homosexual clergy or performing gay marriages. On divorce and remarriage, the ELCA, as a denomination, is permissive of both. The LCMS believes in certain acceptable cases for divorce and views remarriage as wrong after cases of unacceptable divorce. Churches in the LCMC will vary as there is no set position. The ELCA is split on abortion, with many being supportive but others opposed. The LCMS is opposed to abortion as a denomination, and the churches within the LCMC are also opposed to it, though the denomination has no official stance. In all three denominations, some congregations are more contemporary, others more traditional, and others with blended services or both types of service. None of the three denominations are opposed to the responsible consumption of alcohol. None of the denominations as a whole teach a required tithe. The LCMS is opposed to requiring a tithe, while some LCMC churches teach tithing. The ELCA has a modified Episcopal polity that does have congregational influence. Since their full communion agreement with the Episcopal Church, ELCA bishops are part of Anglican apostolic succession. The LCMC is strictly congregational, with very little on a denominational level at all, and the LCMS is also congregational, though the denomination makes statements and operates colleges and seminaries. The ELCA has bishops, pastors, and ordained deacons. The LCMC and LCMS have no bishops in the sense of a higher office, but simply pastors. Deacons are a lay office in the LCMS, often called elders. LCMC churches may ordain deacons or treat it as a lay office. In the ELCA, women may serve in any role, which is also the case in the LCMC, though individual churches may choose to restrict that. In the LCMS, only men may serve in pastoral office. None of the denominations require clergy to be celibate. Only the ELCA is part of the Lutheran World Federation, National Council of Churches, and World Council of Churches. The LCMC is not part of any other organizations, and the LCMS is part of the International Lutheran Council. Now let's jump back into conservative Lutheranism. Most people would consider the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod to be even to the right of the LCMS. Let's learn about Wells. The Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, or WELLS, is a confessional Lutheran church body in the United States. Synod, in some denominations, is a subset of the denomination, but in this case, it's not. WELLS is its own church body. It began in 1850 as the Wisconsin Synod, founded by Lutheran pastors who moved to Wisconsin to minister to German immigrants. In 1917, it merged with the Michigan, Minnesota, and Nebraska Synods. From 1872 until 1963, WELLS was part of the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America, often simply known as the Synodical Conference, an association of Lutheran denominations which were in communion. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod was also a part. In 1963, Wells and the Evangelical Lutheran Synod left, and shortly after, the Synodical Conference was dissolved. The Church says the following of its scripture and doctrinal standards. We confess the full inspiration and inerrancy of the scriptures and their binding authority in all matters of doctrine. The three ecumenical creeds, the primary creedal statements of historic Christianity, summarize well our faith. In addition, we wholeheartedly subscribe to the Lutheran confessions contained in the Book of Concord of 1580 because they are correct expositions of biblical truth. On core Christian theology, the Trinity is affirmed, as is Christ's deity, his virgin birth, death and resurrection, future return, and a literal heaven, hell, and the devil as a personal being. Wells has two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Although some Lutherans refer to absolution as 
a sacrament, well states on their website, the definition of a sacrament that Lutherans ordinarily use points to three characteristics. A sacrament is a sacred act that Christ instituted or established for Christians to do. A sacrament is a sacred act that includes the use of earthly elements, water, bread, and wine, connected with God's word. A sacrament is a sacred act through which Christ offers, gives, and seals the forgiveness of sins and so also life and salvation. Baptism and the Lord's Supper and not absolution fit that definition. A public absolution is often part of the liturgy. Private confession is unknown in most Wells churches, though the practice is permitted. Wells practices infant baptism and baptism of adults not previously baptized. In answer to a question on whether unbaptized infants go to heaven or hell, they state, Infants aren't an exception to God's twin declaration of sinner in Adam and saint in Christ. Therefore, just as we bring the saving gospel to others dead in sin and hostile to God, so we bring our infant children to that saving gospel. In baptism, the Spirit connects them to the saving power of Christ's resurrection. So where does that leave unbaptized babies? Where there is no opportunity to apply the means of grace, the stillborn, miscarriages, or the millions of babies aborted every year, God hasn't supplied an alternate way to apply the gospel directly to them. Although John, filled with the Spirit, leaped in his mother's womb, the angel mentions that is something extraordinary. Since scripture doesn't address directly the eternal destiny of the unborn, we are wise to entrust their judgment to the perfect wisdom of our merciful and just Lord. It's a far different story where parents from ignorance, error, or apathy withhold baptism from their infants. Such withholding of this powerful means of grace hinders God's saving desire to win hearts to himself. On the effect of baptism, a Q&A says, Baptism saves us, 1 Peter 3.21, but baptism isn't an alternate way of salvation apart from saving faith. Baptism saves by creating faith. When the person baptized is already a believer, baptism strengthens faith. In another Q&A, they state, The Wisconsin Synod teaches that baptism and the Lord's Supper are means of grace through which the Holy Spirit works to create or strengthen faith. We believe that Christ's true body and blood are truly present in the Lord's Supper. The Bible does not mandate the mode of baptism. The water in baptism can be applied in the name of the triune God by sprinkling, pouring, immersion, or submersion. More specifically, on the presence of Christ, it is stated, Lutherans believe that the bread and the wine are present in a natural manner in the Lord's Supper, and Christ's true body and blood are present in an illocal, supernatural manner. Under normal circumstances, wine is the element of the cup. But if for health reasons a person is unable to participate, there may be unfermented grape juice available as well. Communion is linked to forgiveness of sins, as a Wells Q&A says, Through the combination of the spoken word and the reception of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus received with the bread and wine, a distinct and intensely personal message is being forcefully communicated to the communicant. Your sins have been atoned for. Jesus Christ died on your behalf. This substitutionary work is reality, and you are here and now assured of this. That message is, one may say, pure gospel. And when the gospel is communicated, the declaration, affirmation, and assurance of the forgiveness of sins is being given and conveyed to the sinner. When that declaration is given, the forgiveness of sins is itself being given by God to the sinner. God never plays games with his gospel, but gives what he promises and promises what he gives. In this way, receiving the Lord's Supper is receiving the forgiveness of sins. Communion in Wells is closed, meaning only Wells church members and those in fellowship with Wells may participate. A Wells Q&A says on confirmation, Confirmation is a church rite or practice that is neither commanded nor forbidden in the Holy Scriptures. Congregations, therefore, are free to have such a rite or to decide not to have such a rite. Historically, in our circles, confirmation is a ceremony in which a congregation gives its catechumens who have been instructed in Christian doctrine, according to the Bible and the Lutheran confessions, an opportunity to confess their faith before the church, praise for them with the laying on of hands, and invites them as such who have sufficient spiritual maturity to participate in the Lord's Supper. The Bible is the 66-book biblical canon. As stated, Wells teaches biblical inerrancy. They deny that inspiration is mechanical dictation. They deny that accidents in transmission of the text and the existence of variants can call into question the doctrine of verbal inerrancy. In their statement on scripture, they deny that natural revelation is sufficient to salvation, and also state, we reject the idea that tradition is a source of revelation. On creation and evolution, in their document, This We Believe, it is said, the creation happened in the course of six consecutive days of normal length by the power of God's almighty word. We reject all theories of evolution as an explanation of the origin of the universe and the human race, and all attempts to harmonize the scriptural account of creation with such theories. 
On Original Sin, Joel Otto writes on the Wells website, The Bible teaches that every person who is born of a mother and father inherits a corrupt sinful condition, going all the way back to the first sin of Adam and Eve. Of all Christian denominations, true Lutherans believe, teach, and confess this more clearly than most. The Augsburg Confession states, It is taught among us that since the fall of Adam, all human beings who are born in the natural way are conceived and born in sin. This means that from birth they are full of evil, lust, and inclination, and cannot by nature possess true fear of God and true faith in God. On salvation, a Wells Q&A says, Because of the redeeming work of Jesus, God declared all people of all time not guilty of the crime of sin. Those who believe in Jesus as Savior appropriate the benefits of Jesus' work for themselves and receive salvation as God's free gift. Saving faith is worked by the Holy Spirit, who works faith through the message of the gospel in word and sacrament. Wells teaches against what they call decision theology. For example, in a Q&A criticizing the Assemblies of God, they say, they teach that faith is a condition of salvation, rather than teaching that faith is the way God has chosen for us to receive salvation. The implication is that an unconverted sinful human being must decide for Christ. The Wisconsin Synod teaches that people by nature are dead in their transgressions and sin, and therefore have no ability to decide of Christ. We do not choose Christ, rather he chose us. We believe that human beings are purely passive in conversion. Another Q&A says, in spiritual matters, to believe in Jesus or not, to be converted or not, we have no freedom of choice on our own. Another says, we do not teach once saved, always saved, because the Bible does not teach it. The Holy Scriptures state that a believer may fall from faith. Several Wells Q&A articles contrast their position with Calvinism. One says that Lutherans and Calvinists generally agree on total depravity and unconditional election. Another says the idea that God would predestine some for eternal punishment in hell is contrary to scripture in a number of ways. Another Q&A says we cannot contribute one speck to our salvation, but by our own arrogance or carelessness we can throw it away. It calls perseverance of the saints a Calvinist error and says that the Calvinist main error is imagining that God has from eternity elected some to be saved and others to be damned. Limited atonement is rejected, and in another Q&A it is stated, Jesus atoned for the sins of all people of all time, including those who are in hell. It is also stated, the scriptural truth of universal objective justification teaches that through the death and resurrection of Christ, the entire world was declared innocent of sin. It is this objective fact to which faith clings. This is the source of our individual certainty that we are right with God. The doctrine of entire sanctification is not taught. In a Q&A responding to the Church of the Nazarene statement on entire sanctification, they say, What sets them apart from most other Protestants is their belief in entire sanctification and Christian perfection. That is, they believe that after conversion, Christians can receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit, by which believers are made free from original sin or depravity, and brought into a state of entire devotion to God and the holy obedience of love made perfect. Read Romans 7, 14-25 to see that even the Apostle Paul did not attain to such perfection. On Pentecostal or Charismatic views, Wells says in a Q&A, The Wisconsin Synod does not teach a baptism in the Holy Spirit separate from and subsequent to water baptism. We do not see speaking in tongues and faith healing as normative for Christians today. A Q&A states the Wisconsin Synod rejects the teaching that Jesus will return to establish a political reign here on earth. This is a reflection of the Wells' position on eschatology, or end times, which is amillennial. They say, at the heart of the millennial error in Bible interpretation is the tendency to take Bible imagery literalistically rather than literally as it should be taken. Literalistic approaches to the biblical prophecies ignore context and the use of symbolic language, especially in apocalyptic sections of scripture. Millennial interpretation stand in opposition to clearly revealed truths found elsewhere in the Bible, e.g. there will be only one resurrection of all people at the last day. A very small part of the Wells' lengthy treatise on the Pope being the Antichrist says, Since scripture teaches that the Antichrist would be revealed and gives the marks by which the Antichrist is to be recognized, and since this prophecy has been clearly fulfilled in the history and development of the Roman papacy, it is scripture which reveals that the papacy is the Antichrist. The mark of the beast is said to be a symbolic way of referring to unbelievers. A Wells Q&A says, We are convinced on the basis of the New Testament treatment of the Old Testament prophecies that the modern nation of Israel is the result of human political development and brings no particularly special significance for the kingdom of God in the end times. The Wells website says, Scripture declares that homosexuality is a sin, and also, can a person remain a practicing homosexual in defiance of God's word and also be a believing member of the church? The answer is no. Believers agree that what God calls 
sin is sin. They also say, marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman. On divorce, a Wells Q&A says, marital unfaithfulness and malicious desertion are the two reasons God gives to allow divorce. Another Q&A states that if a biblical divorce happens for the reasons just given, then the innocent spouse may remarry. On abortion, a Wells resolution says, our hearts are grieved over the millions of unborn who are being murdered each year through the sin of willful abortion. And our synod has historically testified against abortion, except when it is medically necessary to save the life of the mother. Wells churches tend toward more liturgical, though there's no absolutely prescribed worship style, and churches may have contemporary elements. Wells follows a church year calendar, observing Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, and so forth. In answer to an FAQ question, it is stated, the great majority of Wells churches use one of the orders of service in the Synod's official hymnals. These hymnals contain several versions of the historic common service, the principal liturgical rite of English-speaking Lutherans in North America since 1888. Services of the day Daily Office, Matins, Vespers, Compline are also included in these hymnals. Making the sign of the cross, for example, is not something systematic in Wells, and so in many churches you would not see it. However, in some Wells churches it does happen, and some Wells pastors encourage it. As far as liturgical vestments, Wells says, there certainly once was a time when most Wells pastors wore black Geneva gowns, but that day is long past. The majority of students graduating from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary for many years now seem to use white albs. In 2009, a Wells FAQ stated, perhaps 10% of Wells congregations offer some sort of contemporary service. The music at these services ranges from contemporary folk music to what one might call Christian pop. A Q&A on alcohol says, Alcoholism is a sin. Scripture teaches that it is not wrong to use alcohol in moderation. Scripture does condemn the abuse and excessive use of alcohol. On tithing, a Q&A states, For the Old Testament people, the tithe was a minimum command. No such law is given to us in the New Testament. It would be a good custom to use a tithe also as a starting point for us today. It would be a sad reflection on us if we, who have so many more blessings than most of the Old Testament people, both spiritually and materially, are satisfied with giving less than their minimum. Our freedom from laws of giving is an encouragement to do more, not an incentive to do less. Unlike most Lutheran denominations today, Wells does not separate church fellowship from other forms of fellowship. In other words, if Wells does not have communion with a denomination, not only do they not allow people from that denomination to take the Lord's Supper in their congregations, or let their ministers preach in Wells pulpits, or participate with them in missions work, they also will not cooperate with them in Christian education works, or even permit their members to pray with them. This position on prayer fellowship marks one major difference between the LCMS and Wells. The Wells doctrinal statement on the issue says in part, we find it to be an untenable position to distinguish between joint prayer, which is acknowledged to be an expression of church fellowship, and an occasional joint prayer, which purports to be something short of church fellowship. On the polity of the church, an FAQ states, Since scripture does not command any specific form of church government, we do not insist on any particular form of church government as the biblical form. In practice, Wells has a congregational form of government. Each congregation calls its own pastor or pastors, owns its own property, and governs its own affairs. It does so through its voters' assembly and its boards and officers. Doctrinal discipline is the responsibility of the district presidents and their assistants. The topic of ministry offices is one difference between Wells and some other Lutheran bodies like the LCMS. They state in their doctrinal statements the following, The various groupings in Jesus' name for the proclamation of his gospel all lie on the same plane. They are all church in one and the same sense. Some of the groupings listed include mission work, Christian education, the training of public servants of the word. It is also stated, Christ instituted one office in his church, the ministry of the gospel. It is the task of proclaiming the gospel in word and sacrament. This office or service, the ministry of the keys, has been given to the church, i.e. to the believers individually and collectively. The Bible establishes all of public gospel ministry, but does not establish a pastoral office as such, or vest certain duties exclusive to that office. All Christians are equal before God, neither superior nor inferior to one another, and all are equally entrusted with the same ministry of the gospel. Hence, no one may assume the functions of the public ministry except through a legitimate call. It is also stated, There is, however, no direct word of institution for any particular form of the public ministry. The one public ministry of the gospel may assume various forms as circumstances demand. Various functions are mentioned in scripture, feeding, watching, teaching, ruling. In spite of the great diversity in the external forms of the ministerial work, the ministry is essentially one. 
We hold it to be untenable to say that the pastorate of the local congregation as a specific form of the public ministry is specifically instituted by the Lord in contrast to other forms of the public ministry. The Wells website says there is no set office of deacon in Wells, but it is a term that comes from the Bible which congregations could use if they wanted to. We generally use the more general term staff ministers for such workers who are called full time. The church's teaching on the singular office of the church and its appropriate use is also reflected in their teaching on women in ministry. They state, The biblical principle of role relationship applies also to the gatherings of the church. All believers, men and women, will participate at gatherings of worship, prayer, Bible study, and service. The scriptural applications that a woman remains silent and that a woman should not teach a man require that a woman refrain from participating in these gatherings in any way which involves authority over men. In church assemblies, the headship principle means that only men will cast votes when such votes exercise authority over men. Only men will do work that involves authority over men. All Christians, men and women, are to use their God-given gifts to serve each other. Women are encouraged to participate in offices and activities of the public ministry, except where the work involves authority over men. Theologically, the Wells position is then that a woman cannot serve in a ministry role if it involves authority over men, such as being a church's pastor, as a teacher in a Bible college class including men, or voting in a church meeting. Correspondingly, the Wells position is that a woman can serve in any ministry role if it does not involve authority over men. So a woman can preach if only women are present. A Wells Q&A tells us a bit more about the implications of this position in Wells Church practice. The Bible establishes all of public gospel ministry but does not establish a pastoral office as such or vest certain duties exclusive to that office. Tradition has shaped our concept of pastoral duties as we know them today. So the suggestion within Wells that women could assume certain duties of that office may certainly be offensive and confusing to some. Since the Bible does not assign specific duties to the pastor, Wells approaches the matter of women communing women from Scripture's man and woman role relationship principle. Wells' doctrinal statements on the role of man and woman say that a woman may have any part in public ministry that does not assume teaching authority over a man. That, of course, would include women communing women. Wells has had only two instances of women communing women, and our Conference of Presidents has since issued an indefinite moratorium on such practice to keep from offending our brothers until the matter is mutually resolved. Wells is the third largest Lutheran denomination in the United States and, as of 2022, claims 1,264 churches, 344,000 baptized members, and 275,000 communicant members. There are, on average, 272 members per congregation. Wells' membership peaked in 1990 with 421,000 members. In the most recent statistical report, they stated, For three decades, the decline in Wells' membership did not result in a decline in Wells' congregations. In fact, because of efforts in home missions, the total number of Wells congregations grew even as total membership declined. That is changing. Church closures are becoming more common. We must consider the practical implications if the closure rate holds steady or increases over the next decade. They have 282 elementary schools and 27 high schools. Over 44,000 students attend Wells schools. They maintain Martin Luther College in New Ulm, Minnesota and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in Maquan, Wisconsin. As you can see by this outdated map, the strongest presence of Wells is Wisconsin, Michigan, and Southern Minnesota. Wells is in fellowship with the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, ELS, which has 130 congregations. Wells and ELS are the two United States denominations that are part of the Confessional Evangelical Lutheran Conference, which is a fellowship of 34 denominations worldwide. Wells World Missions has 41 world missionaries and works with 400 national pastors. Let's take this discussion of Lutheranism international as we take on an interesting question. Are Lutherans and Anglicans the same? In one of my videos, I received this comment. I'm really confused about you splitting Anglicans from Lutherans, giving the Porvoo communion in Europe that fully joins all apostolic Anglican and Lutheran churches in the continent. The teaching is the same. Edit. I checked your channel. You're American. That explains so much. Eye roll emoji. So I suppose the question is, are Lutheran and Anglican the same thing, or at least the same thing in Europe, if not America? 
So let's start with Europe, and particularly with the Porvu Communion mentioned by the commenter. The Porvu Communion is a group of church bodies that entered into a communion agreement, meaning that members in their churches can, for example, receive communion and pastoral care from the other churches in the communion, and ministers can transfer between the denominations without much difficulty. The Porvu Communion is so named for the city that the signers of the agreement went to afterwards to celebrate joint communion, which took place in the Porvu Cathedral. But it's worth noting that this cannot be fully considered a pan-European communion. Here's a Wikipedia editor's map of countries with Porvu communion member churches. Note that it's a tiny bit outdated as the Lutheran Church in Great Britain is no longer an observer but a full member. As you can see, the communion contains churches in the British Isles, Northern Europe, and a couple in the Iberian Peninsula. Notably absent are any churches from places like Germany, the birthplace of Lutheranism, where one-third of European Lutherans live, or places where smaller numbers of Lutheran churches exist, like the Netherlands. While the Porvu communion can claim to represent a majority of Lutherans, and Anglicans in Europe. They can't claim to represent those from a majority of countries. Another caveat to add is that even within the countries that the Porvu Communion operates, there remain Lutheran and Anglican churches and denominations that are not part of it. To demonstrate, and since the commenter rightly pointed out that I am American, let's use American denominations to examine this point. In the United States, it must be said that there are three major Lutheran denominations. One is the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the most liberal and ecumenical Lutheran denomination. The second is the conservative Lutheran denomination, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and the third is the even more conservative and confessional Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. The ELCA is part of an international communion of Lutheran churches, the Lutheran World Federation, which has 148 member church bodies, 77 million members in those churches, and church bodies from 99 countries. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod isn't part of the LWF. Rather, it is a founding member of the International Lutheran Council, which has 54 member church bodies, 7,150,000 members in those churches, and church bodies from 49 countries. The Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod is not part of either of those communions, but rather part of the Confessional Evangelical Lutheran Conference, of which it was a founding member. The CELC has 34 church bodies in 30 countries. The Porvu Communion itself is part of the first group I mentioned, the Lutheran World Federation, which the ELCA is also a member of. So let's go back to the Porvu map. In Norway, the Church of Norway is part of the Communion, but the Lutheran Church in Norway is part of the ILC, as is the Evangelical Lutheran Diocese of Norway. These denominations are very small compared to the Church of Norway, but they are there, and they are Lutheran. Likewise, there is the Lutheran Confessional Church, which is part of the CELC, and there's also the Evangelical Lutheran Free Church, which is not part of the Porvu Communion, but is part of the LWF. In Denmark, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Denmark is part of Porvu, but the Evangelical Lutheran Free Church of Denmark is in the ILC. In Portugal, the Porvu Communion has an Anglican church body, but the Portuguese Evangelical Lutheran Church is part of the ILC. Lutheran Church of Portugal is part of the CELC, and there's no Lutheran church body that is part of the Porvu Communion or the Lutheran World Federation at all. It's worth noting, since we're talking about communion, that the member churches in the Lutheran World Federation, including the ELCA, practice open communion, where any baptized Christian can commune, whether Lutheran, Anglican, or something else. Some congregations don't even require you to be baptized. For the churches which are part of the ILC, some only allow members of other ILC churches to commune, and the CELC limits communion to other CELC church members. Another important point is that several church bodies are both in the LWF and and the ILC at the same time. On the Anglican side of things, the six churches in the Porvu Communion are also part of the Anglican Communion, which is to say, they are in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. But there do exist in the same geographic area denominations claiming Anglican apostolic succession that are not part of the Anglican Communion, for example, the Free Church of England. So what's the point of this discussion? The point is that even if the Porvu Communion were to mean that there is no difference between Lutheran and Anglican churches within it, the Porvu Communion is not all of Anglicanism or Lutheranism within the countries that it exists in. In most cases, if you live somewhere where there's a church that's part of the Porvu Communion, you can also find either a Lutheran or Anglican church or both that's not part. So the claim that the Porvu Communion fully joins all apostolic Anglican and Lutheran churches in the continent is untrue. And bringing it back to America, relevant to this discussion is the fact that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Episcopal Church signed a full communion agreement titled Called to Common Mission in 2000 that gives them basically the same level of fellowship that the Porvu Communion churches have among themselves. So if the Porvu Communion is all one, so also would be the ELCA and the Episcopal Church. 
Now, before we go on to discuss if churches in the Porvu communion are all the same thing, whether Lutheran or Anglican, let's take note that Anglicans and Lutherans not part of the communion are certainly different. As the commenter noted, this is explainable by one noticing the American scene, but as they missed, it's quite present in Europe too. So what are some of these differences? For example, most Lutherans have only two sacraments, while some Anglicans refer to seven, although the same two, baptism and communion, are the only so-called sacraments of the gospel. Anglicans require apostolic succession in ordaining bishops, while most confessional Lutherans do not. Confessional Lutherans are often quite committed to a real presence view of communion called sacramental union, and Anglicans are often significantly more Big Ten on this issue, with some holding a higher and others a lower view than the Lutherans. There's enough difference between Lutherans and Anglicans that you can have a confessional Lutheran theologian make a video about why I am not Anglican. And if you're comparing a Lutheran denomination to an Anglican one, there are often differences that aren't necessarily tied to the denominational tag, but are differences nonetheless. ILC and CELC Lutherans don't allow women to be ordained, for example, and even 20% of Lutheran World Federation members don't either. On the side of the Anglican Communion, this is also controversial from a worldwide perspective, with almost everyone ordaining women as priests, but bishops being more divided, though in Europe all Anglican Communion churches ordain women. So now let's take on the much more specific claim. Are churches in the Porvu communion the same, whether Anglican or Lutheran? Let's look at the case for answering this with a yes. All of these churches are considered rather big tent, with room for clergy and members to believe differently on a lot of things. Since ministers can move between the denominations, there's a case to be made that any particular local congregation could easily slide into one or the other denomination in the communion if it weren't for the fact that they are in different geographical areas. The Lutheranism and Anglicanism of these denominations has broadened enough that there is wide overlap in their beliefs. For a video that talks more about how this happens, watch my video on theological liberal versus theological conservative. However, on the side of no, not only are there differences between the Lutherans and Anglican denominations in the communion, there are differences between the different denominations of the same tradition. In the British Isles, there are four Anglican denominations part of the Porvoo communion, the Church of Ireland, Church in Wales, Scottish Episcopal Church, and the Church of England. In early 2023, the Church of England officially allowed the blessing of same-sex couples, but still doesn't allow same-sex marriages to be performed in the church. The Church of Ireland and Church in Wales also don't perform same-sex marriages. Meanwhile, the Scottish Episcopal Church has allowed same-sex marriage since 2017. Other differences include liturgical ones, such as the use of the Book of Common Prayer in the Anglican denominations, which is not used in the Lutheran ones. Within the Porvu Common Statement, the document written for the communion, it is stated in recognition of there still being differences between the Lutheran and Anglican bodies, this summary witnesses to a high degree of unity in faith and doctrine. Whilst this does not require each tradition to accept every doctrinal formulation characteristic of our distinctive traditions, it does require us to face and overcome the remaining obstacles to still closer communion. Another part of the statement recognized a current difference when it stated, we commit ourselves to work toward a common understanding of diaconal ministry. All in all, it must be said that though the Porvoo communion has brought a greater level of consistency to Anglicanism and Lutheranism in Europe, it's inaccurate to say that it's gone so far as to make these two denominational families identical. An interesting denomination in the Lutheran tradition is the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. Let's take a quick look at what they believe. To many Lutherans today, the movement which began in Lutheranism called Pietism is a bad word. Pietists saw the people who were growing up in Lutheran churches as having a rote, impersonal religion, one that was in their head but not their heart. However, when pietists had their way, the reforms they brought often led ministers and congregations out of Lutheranism. Pietist influences led to Alexander Mack and the Schwarzenau Brethren, today in denominations like the Church of the Brethren, Brethren Church, and Caris Fellowship. Pietist Lutherans started free churches in America that eventually dropped the Lutheran confessions and became denominations like the Evangelical Free Church and Evangelical Covenant Church. Pietism drew some Lutherans into holding Baptist beliefs, and this led to the formation of the Swedish Baptist General Conference, now known as Converge. All those mentioned are examples of so-called radical pietism, pietism that led to denominational change. But it is possible to be pietist and remain Lutheran, although it may lead to other Lutherans sometimes looking on you with suspicion. One example of a Lutheran denomination that is unashamedly in the pietist tradition is the Church of the Lutheran Brethren of America, or CLBA. They sell on their website a book called Living Lutheran Christianity, a historical sketch of Lutheran pietism, 
which they describe as a historical apology for Lutheran pietism, and especially that expression of Lutheran pietism practiced by the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. When Lutheran immigrants came to the United States in the 1800s from places like Germany, Norway, and Sweden, they would of course start Lutheran congregations in America. However, because there was no easy transcontinental communication at the time, these congregations would just be independent, not connected to any existing denominational body. Over time, they tended to join together and form denominations, and those tended to merge as well. This bottom-up formation of denominations led to other existing Lutheran denominations like the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod and Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and in 1900, five independent congregations in Milwaukee, Wisconsin formed the Church of the Lutheran Brethren in the same way. Those who founded it were pietistic in their beliefs, leading to some of the distinctive differences between the CLBA and other Lutheran denominations. They say of the Confessions that they are a summary of Bible doctrine and adhere to the Apostles' Creed, Nicene and Athanasian creeds, unaltered Augsburg Confession, and Luther's small catechism. The Church affirms God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is virgin-born, true God and true man, died a substitutionary death, arose bodily, ascended to heaven, and there intercedes, and will return and conduct the judgment. The Church has two sacraments, baptism and holy communion. Commonly, the only form of confession and absolution which is not viewed as a sacrament is personally between two believers. The CLB's statement on baptism is quite interesting, as it reflects their pietist influences, which emphasize a person making their faith their own, but at the same time, they retain infant baptism in alignment with the Lutheran confessions. Here's what they say. In the sacrament of baptism, God offers the benefits of Christ's redemption to all people and graciously bestows the washing of regeneration and newness of life to all who believe. God calls the baptized person to live in daily repentance, that is, in sorrow for sin, in turning from sin, and in personal faith in the forgiveness of sin obtained by Christ. By grace, we are daily given the power to overcome sinful desires and live a new life in Christ. Those who do not continue to live in God's grace need to be brought again to repentance and faith through the law and gospel. Because the sinfulness of human nature passes on from generation to generation and the promise of God's grace includes little children, we baptize infants who become members of Christ's believing church through baptism. These children need to come to know that they are sinners with a sinful nature that opposes God. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, they need to confess their sinfulness and yield to God and possess for themselves forgiveness of their sin through Jesus Christ. As they are led from the faith received in infant baptism into a clear, conscious, personal faith in Christ, Christ as their Lord and Savior, and being assured of salvation relies solely on the finished work of Christ and the power of the gospel to live as children of God. Churches do practice confirmation, with a two-year program being the most common, but confirmation does not automatically make one a communicant member of the church. For this, a person must be received into confessing membership, for which the church gives two requirements. All applicants must confess that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as God's only way of salvation and that they have personally received this salvation based on faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. And number two, all applicants must agree to abide by the Lutheran Brethren's statement of faith and the constitution of their local congregation. Of communion, the statement of faith says, In the sacrament of Holy Communion, Christ gives to the communicants his body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine. He declares the forgiveness of sin to all believers and strengthens their faith. Lutheran Brethren churches have open communion, where any baptized Christian may participate, and the standard practice is to receive communion in the pews, not to go forward for it. The canon of scripture is 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. It is verbally and plenarily inspired and free from error. On creation, the church teaches that God is the creator, but there is not a lot of specific detail in their official teaching about things like the age of the earth. However, in the church's identity magazine, they advertised a training weekend for youth stating that one thing to be taught is how faith systems like evolution, Islam, and new age thinking don't make sense. They teach that God created Adam and Eve in his image, that they fell into sin, and as a consequence, the entire human race became totally depraved. On salvation, the church teaches eternal salvation is available to every living human being on earth by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This salvation consists of an instantaneous aspect and an ongoing continual aspect. We long for people to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, to come to know him in a personal way. We are called by the love of Christ to share his gospel. Our mission is as local as our neighborhood and as universal as the whole world. 
Through the word of the law, God brings sinners to know their lost condition and to repent. Through the word of the gospel, he brings sinners to believe in Jesus Christ, to be justified, to enter the process of sanctification, and to have eternal life. This occurs as the Holy Spirit awakens them to see their sin, convicts them of their guilt of sin, and calls them to repent and believe, inviting and enabling them to accept God's grace in Christ. Each one who thus believes is instantly forgiven and credited with Christ's righteousness. The Word then teaches and guides the believer to lead a godly life. In their book explaining the statement of faith, it is set on the connection between baptism and salvation. Baptism is not another way of salvation. Baptism is the way in which God offers to the sinner the benefit of what Christ has done. As the word of the gospel, baptism is a faith creator. Baptism is the message that Christ Jesus has died to wash away your sins. On the details of salvation theology, they say, We have no spiritual strength, no spiritual resources, nothing to contribute to our salvation. This is the natural human condition. Human beings were created to enjoy fellowship with God. Sin has broken that fellowship. But Pelagius claimed that fellowship wasn't really broken. Semi-Pelagians agree that the fellowship was broken, but say if we reach up, God will be pleased with our effort and reach down. Synergists say that God has stretched his hand down. We simply need to reach up and take his hand. The Bible says that God comes down and takes our hand. The church affirms unlimited atonement, saying that there is no human sin for which Christ has not already borne the punishment. They say that the danger of apostasy is real, and that a person must use the means of grace to stay spiritually strong and alive, and to ignore them is to risk spiritual suicide. Sanctification is a continual work of God in justified persons, and the Holy Spirit works through the means of grace, which the church identifies as namely the word and sacraments. They do not teach entire sanctification or Christian perfection in this life. The church is not charismatic, they do not affirm a post-salvation spirit baptism event, and though they believe that the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to all believers, there is no practice of things like words of knowledge or speaking in tongues in worship. On eschatology or end times, the CLBA says, We affirm that scripture teaches that Christ will reign 1,000 years, and that the Church of the Lutheran Brethren's primary tradition is premillennial while allowing for other interpretations. Our premillennial tradition will be taught in our schools and churches. We deny that scripture sets forth every detail of the nature of Christ's reign with minute precision. On marriage, the CLBA says, Marriage is, number one, a covenant between a man and a woman, number two, witnessed publicly, number three, sexually consummated. Any relationship in which one of these elements is missing would be less than a marriage in a biblical sense. An article by Pastor Eric Sorensen on the CLB website says, The Bible clearly teaches that same-sex activity and gender confusion are results of the fall into sin. Nowhere in scripture does one's gender differ from their biological sex. The Bible teaches that the only permissible sexual activity is between one male and one female in the context of marriage. The CLBA's position paper on divorce and remarriage states that remarriage is not a right granted by scripture except in the case of a person whose spouse has committed adultery or has deserted, and that marriage of persons who have been divorced shall be limited to those persons whom the pastors and elders since have been led to full repentance and forgiveness relative to the breaking of their first marriage covenant. The CLBA's position paper on abortion says that willful abortion is contrary to the will of God, a heinous crime, and that the practice, promotion, and legal acceptance of it are destructive of the moral consciousness and character. On euthanasia, the CLBA's position paper on the subject says in part, Christians must reject any deliberate actions taken for the purpose of causing or hastening death, i.e. euthanasia. This may include direct action, e.g. administering a lethal injection, or withholding of medical treatment or care, e.g. denying life-saving medical treatment to a disabled child that would be provided to a normal child or denying food and water. And also says, allowing a person to die when a disease process is irreversible and death is obviously imminent in hours or days is not euthanasia. Patients, or when they are not able to speak for themselves, their families, have the freedom to refuse medical treatments which will not cure, improve, or control their disease process. Treatments will impose a burden beyond any benefits. Lutheran Brethren churches tend not to be liturgical. Ministers don't wear special robes or vestments. Congregations often have traditional worship with hymns, but others are contemporary in style or have blended worship styles. The CLB warns about the dangers of alcohol abuse and addiction, but has no policy requiring abstinence from drinking alcohol. 
On tithing, LeWayne Rajnes, Director of Finance and Personnel for the denomination, writes on the CLB website, Your church needs your tithe. If you're unsure how to tithe, ask your church how you can continue to give, resting in the promises in Malachi that the Lord will pour down a blessing upon you as you give. Church government is congregational, and congregations are autonomous. There is synodical administration, but its authority is advisory as it relates to the congregation. There is an elder board or church council, but there is no higher authority. Pastors and elders together constitute the church council, and the congregation commits its spiritual direction to this group of men. Churches own their own property. Placements of pastors takes place by congregations extending a call to a pastor of their choosing. Churches seeking a pastor form a pastoral call committee and can seek assistance from the denomination's president and other officers. The office of pastor or elder is limited to men only. Women are not to teach Christian doctrine to men, and they are not to exercise authority directly over men in the church. There are 104 congregations in the United States, 12 in Canada, and 1,500 more internationally in the countries of Cameroon, Chad, Japan, and Taiwan. They say, today the Church of the Lutheran Brethren is predominantly African, with national church bodies planted in both Cameroon and Chad, and over 275,000 worshiping each Sunday. In the U.S., 28 congregations, or about one quarter of them, are in Minnesota, and 10 congregations are in North Dakota. There are also several congregations each in the New York and Seattle, Washington metro areas. There are none nearby Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where the denomination began. The U.S. headquarters and Lutheran Brethren Seminary are located in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. China Lutheran Seminary in Taiwan is affiliated with the Lutheran Brethren. The Church of the Lutheran Brethren is the eighth largest Lutheran denomination in the United States by number of congregations behind the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, Lutheran Congregations in Mission for Christ, North American Lutheran Church, Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, and Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Let's pack in a few comparisons. You hopefully now have a good idea of where Lutherans land, but now let's compare them to conservative denominations from other traditions, the Presbyterian Church in America and the Anglican Church in North America. Today we're comparing the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, or LCMS, the Presbyterian Church in America, or PCA, and the Anglican Church in North America, or ACNA. Why compare the LCMS, PCA, and ACNA? Each of these three denominations is the largest confessional church body in their denominational tradition in the U.S. The LCMS is so for Lutheranism, the PCA for Presbyterians, and the ACNA for Anglicans. Each is also the second largest American church body in their tradition overall, behind a mainline body that accommodates those who are not confessional. For Lutheranism, that's the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. For Presbyterians, it's the Presbyterian Church USA. And for Anglicans, it's the Episcopal Church. Additionally, each of these denominations affirms marriage between one man and one woman, while the larger denominations allow same-sex marriages. On this channel, there are videos that explain the doctrinal position of each of these three denominations. Those videos make generous use of quoting the confessions and documented positions of the churches to reference their positions. This video would be exceptionally long if I did so, and so if you want to verify any of the information presented here against written positions of the churches, I suggest you watch the individual videos. The confessional standard of the LCMS is the Book of Concord, which contains, among other things, the Augsburg Confession and Luther's Large and Small Catechisms. In the PCA, it is the Westminster Confession of Faith with the larger and shorter catechisms, and the ACNA affirms the 1662 Book of Common Prayer and the 39 Articles of Religion of 1571. On some major doctrines of Christianity, you'll find each church to hold the same position. All affirm the Trinity, literal death and resurrection of Christ, his virgin birth, a literal heaven and hell, and future judgment. Each denomination is sacramental. Each views baptism and the Lord's Supper as two of those sacraments. Those are the only two in the PCA. LCMS Lutherans would commonly say the same, but absolution may also be considered a sacrament, and is called such in the Augsburg Confession. The ACNA holds to baptism and the Lord's Supper as the two sacraments of the gospel, and many would stop there. However, especially the Anglo-Catholics within the denomination would allow that the other five sacraments are truly sacraments, those being confirmation, penance, orders, matrimony, and extreme unction. It's controversial, but the ACNA's 2019 Catechism to be a Christian does call those five sacraments. All three denominations practice baptism primarily for infants and secondarily for unbaptized adults. The LCMS and PCA view immersion, pouring, and sprinkling as acceptable modes, but primarily practice sprinkling. The ACNA endorses immersion and pouring. 
The LCMS believes that new birth and regeneration happens in baptism. The PCA believes baptism is a sign of regeneration, but that the efficacy is not tied to the moment of baptism. The ACNA 2019 Book of Common Prayer affirms that through the water of baptism, we are made regenerate by the Holy Spirit. The LCMS and ACNA practice confirmation. In the PCA, there may be a public profession at First Communion, but it is optional. The LCMS believes in real presence, that those who partake in communion partake in the real body and blood of Christ, in addition to the real bread. The PCA holds to a spiritual presence of Christ in the elements, and the ACNA has some variety, but real presence is most commonly affirmed. All three denominations believe that participation in the sacrament is a means of grace. The LCMS, PCA, and ACNA believe in a 66-book biblical canon. Of the three, the PCA would be the one where you would hear about the Apocrypha the absolute least. The LCMS is also not a place where you would hear much about it, but they do publish a Bible with Apocrypha, as Luther himself said the books were good to read. The ACNA doesn't call the Apocrypha canonical, but many in the pews consider them more than just helpful books. The Apocrypha is in many Bibles in use in ACNA churches, and the lectionaries in the Book of Common Prayer contain Apocrypha readings. The LCMS holds to the scripture as inerrant and infallible, as does the PCA. The ACNA hesitates to use the word inerrant, though at least one of its dioceses does. They do say that it is the final authority and unchangeable standard. The LCMS official position is in a literal six-day creation and literal creation of Adam rejecting human evolution. Many in the pews do believe differently, though. The PCA teaches a literal creation of Adam and Eve, too, but does allow for more latitude on the length of creation. The ACNA holds no required viewpoint on the age of the earth or human evolution. All three denominations affirm a human sin nature originating in Adam's sin. The LCMS rejects the idea of a one-time born-again salvation experience. This is also generally rejected in the ACNA and most in the PCA would affirm the idea of a salvation event. All three denominations deny that good works are required for justification. On Calvinism, the PCA holds to all of the five points, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and preservation or perseverance of the saints. The LCMS holds to total depravity, but denies the other four points. The ACNA affirms predestination generally, but doesn't require any particular view on the five points. The LCMS is mostly not accepting to the charismatic movement within its churches. The PCA's Book of Church Order is cessationist, and similarly, charismatic practice is restricted. The ACNA would be most friendly to charismatism, with even some ministers being charismatic. The reception a charismatic individual would have in the ACNA would vary depending on the diocese. On eschatology, the LCMS is amillennial. The ACNA and PCA are open to many views, amillennial being most common, and other views like postmillennial and classical premillennial also represented. Dispensationalism would be frowned on in all three denominations. On homosexuality, all three denominations believe it to be sinful and reject the practice of gay marriage. All three denominations teach that marriage is a lifelong covenant, but allow for divorce as acceptable under certain circumstances. The LCMS and PCA particularly note when a spouse commits sexual unfaithfulness or abandons their partner, these are legitimate grounds for divorce. They also state that remarriage should not take place after divorce from biblical reasons, but is permitted after divorce for biblical reasons. The ACNA is not so precise in its official statements, but those views would be very common. A bishop is required to approve marriages to be performed by clergy of the church if either party is divorced. All three denominations are opposed to abortion. All three denominations have churches that operate in different styles, with some more high church and others more contemporary. There are many congregations in each denomination that follow their historical tradition practice and don't utilize contemporary worship styles or music at all, and those who are theologically opposed to it. None of the three denominations are opposed to the responsible use of alcohol. The LCMS does not teach required tithing, while the PCA and ACNA teach that the tithe, or 10% of one's income, is the minimum standard of giving to the church. The LCMS churches have congregational polity, the PCA has Presbyterian, and the ACNA has Episcopal. In LCMS churches, the ordained offices are pastor and deacon. In the PCA, there are elders and deacons, with elders divided into teaching and ruling elders. In the ACNA, there are bishops, priests, and deacons. The LCMS does not ordain women to pastor or deacon, but has unordained deaconesses. The PCA ordains only men as elders and deacons, and frowns on unordained women deacons, though it has happened in PCA churches. The ACNA allows the dioceses to decide on priests and deacons. So some dioceses do ordain women, and others don't. But in all cases, bishops are to be men only. None of the denominations require clergy to be celibate.
Of the three, only the PCA is in the National Association of Evangelicals. None are part of the World Council of Churches or National Council of Churches. The LCMS is the largest of the three denominations by far, with 1,968,641 members in 6,046 congregations, followed by the PCA with 383,721 members in 1,915 congregations, and the ACNA with 127,624 members in 972 congregations. Let's take another comparison. This time, confessional Lutheranism is compared to independent Baptists. Independent Baptist versus Confessional Lutheran. What do they believe? First, let's clarify Confessional Lutheran. I wanted this video to just be Independent Baptist versus Lutheran, but there is enough variation between Lutherans today that I don't think putting them together would be helpful. The largest body of Lutherans in the United States is the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or ELCA. A 2016 count says there are approximately 3.5 million baptized members in 9,252 congregations. The second largest body in the USA is the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, or LCMS, in 2016 having approximately 2 million baptized members in 6,100 congregations. And the third largest being the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, or WELS, having 364,000 members in 1,275 congregations. Of these three, the LCMS and the WELS are confessional Lutheran, and there are some confessional Lutherans in the ELCA, but most confessional Lutheran churches that were at one time part of the ELCA have now left. A confessional Lutheran is one who believes that the doctrine found in the Book of Concord, a year 1580 compilation of confessional documents, is completely faithful to the teachings of the Bible. Therefore, confessional Lutherans use that doctrine as a test of orthodoxy. Churches that are in opposition to something within it are excluded from their denominations. They don't claim the Book of Concord as an addition to the Bible, and confessional Lutherans accept sola scriptura, that their only authority is scripture, but they would say that there is no contradiction between the Book of Concord and the scriptures, and so for one to disagree with the Book of Concord, they are actually disagreeing with the Bible, which the Book of Concord only explains. In contrast to this, the ELCA and many other non-confessional Lutherans are open to more theologically liberal stances than the confessions allow, typically due to a rejection of biblical inerrancy and subsequently a modernist application of the scripture. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the differences between independent Baptists and confessional Lutherans. One of the most apparent is the confessional part. Most independent Baptists aren't creedal, they reject creeds, even if they don't disagree with them per se. But let's take a look at some of the creeds from the Book of Concord and see what independent Baptists might have a problem with. First, the Apostles' Creed. Most of this independent Baptists would agree with. Most Baptists disagree that Christ descended into a burning hell. Instead, that hell in Acts 2.31, for example, refers to the same place referred to as paradise in Luke 23.43. However, the Apostles' Creed doesn't explicitly state that the hell being referred to is a burning hell. Many independent Baptists also disagree with the line in the Lutheran version of the creed, the Holy Christian Church. Many independent Baptists don't accept the concept of a universal church, whether visible like the Roman Catholic concept or invisible like the Lutheran and Evangelical concept. Lutherans view the line, the communion of saints, in the same way, as synonymous to the universal church. Baptists accept that there is such a universal of all believers, which they would call the family of God, but not that it is synonymous with the church. Moving on to the Nicene Creed, the issue that independent Baptists would have with this creed include the same ones already mentioned from the Apostles' Creed, but also the statement, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. All Baptists reject baptism as being a part in the remission of sins viewing it as unnecessary for salvation. The issues independent Baptists have with the Athanasian Creed would be ones found in the other creeds. But now let's look at the Augsburg Confession. This patently Lutheran confession actually contains several direct rebuffs to the beliefs of the Anabaptists, of which many are the predecessors of the modern Baptists. This creed mentions the things I've discussed already, so we'll go past that and discuss new differences. Article 2 of the Confession is on original sin. Independent Baptists vary on this. 
Some affirm original sin, that everyone is born with the guilt of original sin. Others would only say that everyone is born as a sinner and so will commit sin. However, all independent Baptists reject that there is a needed solution to remove this sin in infant baptism, as promoted in the Augsburg Confession. Instead, they hold to a concept of an age of accountability, where before children have the intellectual capability to profess faith in Christ, they are not accountable for their sin, and so will go to heaven regardless. After the age of accountability, which may vary from person to person, they are accountable and must be born again or saved to receive remission of sins. Independent Baptists would then have such a person be baptized, but do not view it as necessary for them to have their sins removed. Independent Baptists would agree with Article 4 that we are justified by faith, but reject much of Article 5. When an Independent Baptist speaks of being justified by faith, they refer only to the born-again or salvation experience that I just mentioned. Confessional Lutherans don't view justification by faith in the same way. Article 5 of the Ministry of the Church says this, that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted. For through the word and sacraments, as through instruments, the Holy Ghost is given, who works faith, where and when it pleases God, in them that hear the gospel, to wit, that God, not for our own merits, but for Christ's sake, justifies those who believe that they are received into grace for Christ's sake. They condemn the Anabaptists and others who think that the Holy Ghost comes to men without the external word through their own preparations and works. Independent Baptists reject the idea of sacraments. There is nothing necessary for salvation other than the individual belief, and they view the idea of sacraments as being necessary to receive faith as a form of work salvation. Likewise, they believe the Holy Ghost indwells individuals at the moment they are saved. Independent Baptists generally disagree with Article 8. Article 8 of the Augsburg Confession was written to explain the confessional Lutheran belief that even if evil men are in control of a church, that the sacraments are still valid. As mentioned before, Baptists don't believe in sacraments. However, the closest Baptist thing is an ordinance, baptism and the Lord's Supper being the only two. Most independent Baptists will not recognize baptism as legitimate if done in a church that they view as illegitimate. In other words, even confessional Lutherans will not make someone be baptized again if they were baptized in a non-confessional Lutheran church, or a Methodist, Presbyterian, or a United Church of Christ church, or some other, or even a Baptist church. However, independent Baptists generally would only accept someone as truly having been baptized if it was done in a Baptist church, by immersion, to a believer, not an infant. Many independent Baptist churches will not even accept most Baptist baptisms, but only if the church is of like faith and practice. In these cases, Baptists will have the person rebaptized. Additional differences in baptism are found in Article 9. Baptists reject the statement that baptism is necessary for salvation, or that it confers the grace of God, or that children, namely infants, are to be baptized. Basically, there's not a word in Article 9 that an independent Baptist would agree with. Baptists view the Lord's Supper as entirely symbolic. The elements are not the body and blood of Christ, don't become the body and blood of Christ, don't have the spiritual presence of his body and blood, but are strictly and only symbolic. The Augsburg Confession tells us that confessional Lutherans say the body and blood of Christ are truly present. Independent Baptists also reject Article 11. Baptists believe in the priesthood of the believer and only believe a person should confess their sins to God and to the person they've wronged, but not to a priest or bishop or anyone else in the church. Article 12 of the Augsburg Confession is on repentance. Though some independent Baptists believe a person can lose their salvation, the great majority hold to a doctrine of eternal security, commonly referred to as once saved, always saved. Most independent Baptists would reject, then, the statements in this article that for those who have fallen after baptism, there is remission of sins whenever they are converted, that the church ought to impart absolution to those thus returning to repentance. In the same vein, most independent Baptists reject that a person can lose the Holy Ghost. Article 13 is a Lutheran statement on sacraments, which Baptists would reject. Here is Article 14. Of ecclesiastical order, they teach that no one should publicly teach in the church or administer the sacraments unless he be regularly called. Independent Baptists generally agree in a person being ordained to ministry, that is, by some independent church, but not by any ecclesiastical body. Some Baptists have sat in jail, even, for refusing to be sanctioned by official churches or government bodies. 
Article 18 is on the will, and Baptists have many different views of free will. Calvinist independent Baptists would hold to something quite similar to the confessional Lutheran stance, that man doesn't even have the ability to make the decision to accept Christ. Another portion of independent Baptists would take the position that a person cannot freely turn to God unless God first enables them to by drawing them, but then would state that God through Jesus Christ draws all men to himself. But there is a variety of views on this matter among independent Baptists. All but Calvinist independent Baptists would affirm Article 19 that God was not the cause of sin. Baptists reject the Mass, more commonly called the Divine Service, in Lutheran churches today. Another point not made so clear from the Confessions is that though Lutherans don't view a hierarchy of churches to be necessary and accept the idea of free Lutheran churches, for example, some confessional Lutherans being in those free churches, many other confessional Lutherans do belong to denominations with such hierarchy. Independent Baptists reject such a hierarchy as entirely unbiblical. Confessional Lutherans typically have a very different view of end times events from independent Baptists. For example, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod rejects the idea of a literal 1,000 year millennium, instead holding to an amillennialist view, while most independent Baptists are premillennial. Lutherans baptize by pouring, sprinkling, or immersion, but Baptists only accept immersion. These mark the main theological differences between confessional Lutherans and independent Baptists. Many also have very different worship styles, though this varies from church to church. Let me also compare a few other things about the LCMS and the WELS that aren't necessarily the case for all confessional Lutherans, but are useful when discussing these two denominations' similarities to independent Baptists. The LCMS and WELS both prohibit women from the pastorate, which is also the case for independent Baptists. The WELS also prohibits women from voting in church-wide votes that pertain to men, which is not the case in most independent Baptist churches. Independent Baptists, along with the WELS and the LCMS, affirm biblical inerrancy. The WELS and LCMS, as well as independent Baptists, view extramarital sex and homosexuality as sinful. The LCMS holds to close communion, meaning only members of the LCMS or like-minded Lutherans can participate. The WELS also does for WELS members or those like-minded. Independent Baptists have a range of beliefs. Many hold closed communion, meaning communion is only for those in the membership of the particular church. There are those who hold close communion and open communion as well. And here's another comparison. Let's compare the Missouri Synod to Pentecostals, both Trinitarian and Oneness. Assemblies of God and the United Pentecostal Church have some things in common. Of course, both of them can trace their roots to the emergence of Pentecostalism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Both hold the heritage of some of the earliest churches in their respective lines of Pentecostalism. Both of them are the more white side of their traditions, with there being separate majority black denominations in their stream. And both have worked to remedy that over the decades, seeking a more inclusive church. But beyond these similarities, there are some very major differences. They aren't best buddies. UPCI folks would often tell you that people in Assemblies of God are polytheists. They would say that most AG members aren't even saved. And likewise, many AG folks would tell you that the UPCI and other Oneness Pentecostals can't be rightly considered Christian and that their salvation requirements are work salvation. The divide between the Trinitarian and Oneness streams of Pentecostalism is a deep one. In this video, we're going to see how these two denominations compare. And to make it interesting, I'm tossing in a Lutheran denomination so you can see how each of the Pentecostal denominations nations stack up against an entirely different Christian tradition. It's the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which is the largest conservative Lutheran denomination in the U.S. On the nature of God, all three denominations affirm the following. Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is God. However, AG and LCMS say that these three are persons. There's one God in three persons. UPCI denies this. All three are manifestations of the one person of God. UPCI likewise denies the eternal sonship of Jesus, but rather at the Incarnation is when God was manifested as the Son. All three do agree, however, that Jesus was virgin-born, that he lived a sinless life, he died and rose again. They agree there's a future judgment day and a literal heaven and hell. On ordinances or sacraments, AG usually says ordinances. UPCI sometimes uses both terms and the LCMS says sacraments. In AG churches, there are two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. In UPCI churches, there are three, 
baptism, the Lord's Supper, and feet washing. In the LCMS, there are two or three. The first two are baptism and the Lord's Supper, and private confession is the third, not always practiced. AG and UPCI churches only baptize by immersion. Immersion, pouring, and sprinkling are all acceptable in LCMS churches, but immersion is least common. Neither AG or UPCI churches baptize infants, while LCMS churches do. For this reason, the LCMS is also the only of the three denominations which have confirmation. As for the Lord's Supper in AG churches and UPCI, the position is that Christ is not specially present, but that it is a memorial. In the LCMS, the position is called sacramental union, that the body and blood are present in, with, and under the bread and wine. In AG and UPCI churches, the element of the cup is unfermented grape juice, while in the LCMS it is wine. Some churches may provide a non-alcoholic alternative and a gluten-free bread alternative as well. Communion in AG and UPCI churches is not normally closed, meaning all Christians are invited to participate. Of course, the apostolic Pentecostal position on who is a Christian does cut down a bit on who practically would be invited. In the LCMS, only those in LCMS churches or in altar fellowship can participate. It's close communion. This rule is not always consistently enforced. The Bible in all three denominations is affirmed to be a 66-book canon. For most in the AG or UPCI, the Apocrypha might as well not exist. In LCMS churches, it isn't scripture, and many are unfamiliar with it, but there's a bit more room to say along with Martin Luther that it is useful and good to read. All three denominations affirm that the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and infallible. As for Bible versions, there is not necessarily a standard in the LCMS. Many translations are used. In the AG, you are more likely than in the LCMS to find a TR-based version like the KJV or NKJV in use, and in the UPCI, KJV and NKJV are the great majority, with some making this a deal-breaker issue. On creation, none of the three require a young earth creation stance. UPCI churches are, however, mostly young earth. In AG churches, it's a major position, but there are also old earth and theistic evolutionists. In the LCMS, there's not a requirement on the age of the earth, though they do affirm a literal six-day creation. Salvation is where we see major differences in all three groups. First, is salvation something that happens in a salvation event or experience, or is it a gradual lifelong thing? Although all three denominations would say that salvation is something that affects your whole life, not a do-it-once-and-forget-it thing, in the AG, it takes place in a definite salvation experience, a moment of belief. In the LCMS, this view is rejected. Salvation began at the cross, and that grace is given in baptism, communion, and confession too. It's a lifelong thing. In the UPCI, like in the LCMS, baptism is viewed as part of salvation. The LCMS probably leaves even more room than the UPCI does for exceptions where unbaptized people may be saved. However, of the three, only the UPCI requires spirit baptism evidenced by speaking in tongues as a necessary part of salvation. In other words, no tongue speaking, no salvation. All three denominations teach that a person can apostatize and be lost. In other words, they deny unconditional eternal security. The LCMS affirms predestination to life, but not to damnation. That is rejected in AG and UPCI churches. All three denominations teach progressive sanctification and that there is no in this life entire sanctification experience. That particular is another point of differentiation in Pentecostalism. Holiness Pentecostals, like the Church of God in Christ, teach a sanctification experience following salvation but preceding spirit baptism. Speaking of spirit baptism, LCMS churches don't teach this as an event for a believer. Most would say it happens at infant baptism. For AG churches, after a believer is saved, this comes sometime later in a post-salvation experience. For the UPCI, this spirit baptism takes place at the moment of salvation, or rather is the third and essential part of salvation, along with baptism and repentance. AG churches do teach that spirit baptism is evidenced by speaking in tongues. However, since it is a post-salvation experience, speaking in tongues is not necessary for salvation. In the UPCI, spirit baptism is also taught as bringing speaking in tongues with it, but since spirit baptism is necessary for salvation, then tongues is too. In the LCMS, there is no teaching of an initial evidence. In fact, only a very small handful of LCMS churches have ever taught that speaking in tongues is something available or legitimate today and it's viewed as unorthodox in nearly all LCMS churches. Meanwhile, in the AG and UPCI, miraculous spiritual gifts are taught as continuing, so people may have the gift of tongues or prophecy or healing. AG and UPCI churches also teach that people can and should pray in tongues. On eschatology, AG and UPCI churches are premillennial. Viewpoints on the timing of the rapture compared to the tribulation period can vary. 
In the LCMS, eschatology is amillennial, which also means that there is no literal tribulation period. When Christ returns, there is immediate resurrection of the just and the unjust for judgment. All three denominations teach that fornication, adultery, and homosexuality are sinful. Marriage is only between one man and one woman. The AG position on divorce is that it is only acceptable in cases of habitual sexual immorality or abandonment. In the UPCI, adultery and fornication are the only grounds for divorce. Sexual unfaithfulness and abandonment are listed as the reasons for divorce in the LCMS. All three denominations have officially stated opposition to abortion. Worship style varies in all three. In the LCMS, you'll find a level of high church style among some congregations that is not present in the Pentecostal denominations, but there are churches with a mixed or contemporary style too. Strict hymnody without any contemporary music or upbeat atmosphere is not common in AG or UPCI churches. In AG and UPCI churches, abstinence from alcohol is the official position. For the LCMS, there is no restriction on drinking alcohol, though there are cautions against its misuse. AG and UPCI churches say that tithing is a required practice. In the LCMS, it is not taught as required, and many churches don't teach it at all. In AG churches, some still may teach a level of modesty and clothing or caution against worldly entertainment, but this is not nearly as strict as in times past, and many churches don't talk about these things. This too is not a major emphasis in the LCMS. With that in mind, here's some of what the UPCI requires of members. No attending theaters, dances, no mixed gender swimming, women may not cut their hair, have makeup, wear ornamental jewelry, wear pants or short skirts, no television in the home, no participation in competitive sports. Church polity in the Assemblies of God is normally congregational, but there are some Presbyterian elements for some churches. UPCI is a mix of congregational and Presbyterian polity, and LCMS is congregational. In the AG, there are ministers certified, licensed, or ordained. A minister may or may not be a pastor. UPCI also has ordained ministers, some of which are pastors. In the LCMS, there are pastors. AG and UPCI churches have lay deacons. In the LCMS, these are normally called elders, a lay office, but sometimes called deacons. In the AG and UPCI, women can serve as pastors and deacons. In the LCMS, pastors and elders may only be men. There is a separate, non-ordained lay serving role of deaconess that women may have. There are 13,000 U.S. Assemblies of God churches. The UPCI has 4,883 in the U.S. and Canada, and the LCMS has 6,046 in the U.S. Additionally, AG churches number 375,000 worldwide, and the UPCI has 42,000 worldwide. The LCMS is a U.S. denomination, but part of the International Lutheran Council, which has church bodies with similar teachings worldwide. This channel is all about denominations. If you haven't, take a look around and consider subscribing. Members at readytoharvest.com get all my videos ad-free, transcripts, and other perks, and they make my work here possible. Thank you. We're nearing the end. Let's close things out with a final hurrah. Lutherans explained in two minutes. Martin Luther, a Catholic priest, had issues with the theology and practice of the Catholic Church and attempted to reform it. Ultimately, Luther and his followers found themselves rejected, and their churches, originally self-described as evangelical, became known as Lutherans. Lutheranism became prevalent in Germany, where Luther lived, and also spread to places like Norway and Sweden and to America. Lutherans hold to at least two sacraments, baptism and communion. Infant baptism is practiced and viewed as bringing salvation, and for communion or the divine service, Service, they believe that Christ's body and blood is present with the elements, though the elements themselves are not transformed. Private confession is a legitimate sacrament according to the Book of Concord, Lutheranism's collection of core theological documents, but not all Lutheran denominations today practice it. The Bible is a 66-book canon. Salvation is taught as something that begins with baptism and is nurtured one's whole life, not as a one-time conversion experience. God does choose who will be saved, but doesn't choose anyone to damnation. People can follow away and be lost. Conservative confessional Lutherans believe the Bible is without error and restrict women from being pastors, sometimes have closed communion where only members of the denomination can partake, and don't perform same-sex marriage. There are also liberals who don't see the Bible as inerrant and have same-sex marriage and moderate denominations with positions between these. Though today there are contemporary congregations, there are still many that are quite liturgical with an organ, liturgy, special garments and readings, etc. Lutherans often had state churches, but as people from Lutheran countries moved to the New World, they wanted to have free churches, churches separate from the state. 
This video is the first in a playlist I'm making, which is of compilation videos on Christian denominations. Click the link on the screen to go to that playlist, and you can bookmark it for later because there's more long-form videos like this one coming soon so you can learn all about different Christian denomination traditions.